Chapter 81 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 81 The Room of the Retired Baker. The evening of the day on which the Count of Morcerf had left Donglars' house with feelings of shame and anger at the rejection of the projected alliance, Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti, with curled hair, moustaches in perfect order, and white gloves which fitted admirably, had entered the courtyard of the banker's house in La Chaussée d'Antin. He had not been more than ten minutes in the drawing-room before he drew Danglars aside into the recess of a bow window, and, after an ingenious preamble, related to him all his anxieties and cares since his noble father's departure. He acknowledged the extreme kindness which had been shown him by the banker's family, in which he had been received as a son and where, besides his warmest affections, had found an object on which to centre in Mademoiselle Danglars. Danglars listened with the most profound attention. He had expected this declaration for the last two or three days, and when at last it came his eyes glistened as much as they had lowered on listening to Morcerf. He would not, however, yield immediately to the young man's request, but made a few conscientious objections. "'Are you not rather young, Monsieur Andrea, to think of marrying?' "'I think not, sir,' replied Monsieur Cavalcanti. "'In Italy, the nobility generally marry young. "'A life is so uncertain that we ought to secure happiness while it is within our reach.' "'Well, sir,' said Danglars, "'in case your proposals, which do me honour, are accepted by my wife and daughter,' By whom shall the preliminary arrangements be settled? So important a negotiation should, I think, be conducted by the respective fathers of the young people. Sir, my father is a man of great foresight and prudence. Thinking that I might wish to settle in France, he left me at his departure together with the papers establishing my identity, a letter promising, if he approved of my choice, one hundred and fifty thousand livres per annum from the day I was married. So far as I can judge, I suppose this to be a quarter of my father's revenue. I, said Danglars, have always intended giving my daughter five hundred thousand francs as her dowry. She is besides my sole heiress. All would then be easily arranged if the baroness and her daughter are willing. We should command an annuity of one hundred and seventy-five thousand livres. Supposing also I should persuade the Marquis to give me my capital, which is not likely, but still is possible, we would place these two or three million in your hands, whose talent might make it realize ten per cent. I never give more than four per cent, and generally only three and a half. But to my son-in-law, I would give five and we would share the profit. "'Very good, father-in-law,' said Cavalcanti, yielding to his low-born nature which would escape sometimes through the aristocratic gloss with which he sought to conceal it. Correcting himself immediately, he said, "'Excuse me, sir, a hope alone makes me almost mad. What will not reality do?' "'But,' said Danglars, who on his heart did not perceive how soon the conversation which was at first disinterested was turning to a business transaction. There is doubtless a part of your fortune your father could not refuse you. Which? asked the young man. That you inherit from your mother. Truly from my mother, Leonora Cosinari. How much may it amount to? Indeed, sir, said Andrea. I assure you, I have never given the subject a thought, but I suppose it must have been at least two millions. Danglars felt as much overcome with joy as the miser who finds a lost treasure, or as the shipwrecked mariner who feels himself on solid ground instead of in the abyss which he expected would swallow him up. "'Well, sir,' said Andrea, bowing to the banker respectfully, "'may I hope?' "'You may not only hope,' said Danglars, "'but consider it a settled thing, "'if no obstacle arises on your part.' "'I am indeed rejoiced,' said Andrea. "'But,' said Danglars thoughtfully, 
How is it that your patron, Monsieur de Monte Cristo, did not make his proposal for you? Andrea blushed imperceptibly. I have just left the Count, sir, said he. He is doubtless a delightful man, but inconceivably peculiar in his ideas. He esteems me highly. He even told me he had not the slightest doubt that my father would give me the capital instead of the interest of my property. He has promised to use his influence to obtain it for me, but he also declared that he never had taken on himself the responsibility of making proposals for another, and he never would. I must, however, do him the justice to add that he assured me if ever he had regretted the repugnance he felt to such a step it was on this occasion, because he thought the projected union would be a happy and a suitable one. Besides, if he will do nothing officially, he will answer any questions you propose to him. And now, continued he with one of his most charming smiles, having finished talking to the father-in-law, I must address myself to the banker. And what may you have to say to him? said Donglar, laughing in his turn. That the day after tomorrow I shall have to draw upon you for about four thousand francs. But the Count, expecting my bachelor's revenue, could not suffice for the coming month's outlay, has offered me a draft for twenty thousand francs. It bears his signature, as you see, which is all sufficient. Bring me a million such as that, said Donglar. I shall be well pleased, putting the draft in his pocket. Fix your own hour for tomorrow, and my cashier shall call on you with a cheque for eighty thousand francs. At ten o'clock, then, if you please. I should like it early, as I am going into the country tomorrow. Very well. At ten o'clock you are still at the Hôtel des Princes? Yes. The following morning, with the banker's usual punctuality, the eighty thousand francs were placed in the young man's hands, as he was on the point of starting, after having left two hundred francs for Caderousse. He went out chiefly to avoid this dangerous enemy, and returned as late as possible in the evening. But scarcely had he stepped out of his carriage, when the porter met him with a parcel in his hand. "'Sir,' said he, "'that man has been here.' "'What man?' said Andrea carelessly, apparently forgetting him whom he but too well recollected. "'Him to whom your excellency pays that little annuity.' "'Oh,' said Andrea, "'my father's old servant. "'Well, you gave him the two hundred francs I had left for him.' "'Yes, your excellency.' "'Andrea had expressed a wish to be thus addressed. "'But,' continued the porter, "'he would not take them.' "'Andrea turned pale, "'but as it was dark his pallor was not perceptible.' "'What, he would not take them?' said he with slight emotion. "'No, he wished to speak to your excellency. "'I told him you were gone out, and after some dispute "'he believed me and gave me this letter, "'which he had brought with him already sealed. "'Give it to me,' said Andrea, "'and he read by the light of his carriage lamp. "'You know where I live. "'I expect you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Andrea examined it carefully, to ascertain if the letter had been opened, or if any indiscreet eyes had seen its contents. But it was so carefully folded that no one could have read it, and the seal was perfect. "'Very well,' said he. "'Poor man, he is a worthy creature.' He left the porter to ponder on these words, not knowing which most to admire, the master or the servant. "'Take out the horses quickly, and come up to me.' said Andrea to his groom. In two seconds, the young man had reached his room and burnt Caderousse's letter. The servant entered just as he had finished. "'You are about my height, Pierre,' said he. "'I have that honour, Your Excellency.' "'You have a new livery yesterday.' "'Yes, sir.' "'I have an engagement with a pretty little girl for this evening, and do not wish to be known. Lend me your livery till to-morrow.' I may sleep, perhaps, at an inn. Pierre obeyed. Five minutes after, Andrea left the hotel, completely disguised, took a cabriolet, 
and ordered the driver to take him to the Cheval Rouge at Picpus. The next morning he left that inn as he had left the Hôtel du Prince without being noticed, walked down the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, along the boulevard to Rue Menilmontant, and stopped at the door of the third house on the left, looking for someone of whom to make inquiry in the porter's absence. "'For whom are you looking, my fine fellow?' asked the fruiteress on the opposite side. "'Monsieur Payatin, if you please, my good woman,' replied Andrea. "'A retired baker?' asked the fruiteress. "'Exactly. He lives at the end of the yard on the left, on the third story. Andrea went as she directed him, and on the third floor he found a hare's paw, which by the hasty ringing of the bell it was evident he pulled with considerable ill-temper. A moment after Caderousse's face appeared at the grating in the door. "'Ah, you are punctual,' said he, as he drew back the door. "'Confound you and your punctuality,' said Andrea, throwing himself into a chair, in a manner which implied that he would rather have flung it at the head of his host. "'Come, come, my little fellow, don't be angry. See, I have thought about you. Look at the good breakfast we are going to have. Nothing but what you are fond of.' Andrea, indeed, inhaled the scent of something cooking which was not unwelcome to him, hungry as he was. It was that mixture of fat and garlic peculiar to provincial kitchens of an inferior order, added to that of dried fish, and above all the pungent smell of musk and cloves. These odours escaped from two deep dishes which were covered and placed on a stove, and from a copper pan placed in an old iron pot. In an adjoining room, Andrea saw also a tolerably clean table prepared for two, two bottles of wine sealed, the one with green, the other with yellow, a supply of brandy in a decanter, and a measure of fruit in a cabbage leaf, cleverly arranged on an earthenware plate. "'What do you think of it, my little fellow?' said Caderousse. "'Ah, that smells good. You know I used to be a famous cook. Do you recollect how you used to lick your fingers?' "'You are among the first who tasted any of my dishes, "'and I think you relish them tolerably.' "'While speaking, Caderousse went on peeling a fresh supply of onions. "'But,' said Andrea ill-temperedly, "'by my face, if it was only to breakfast with you "'that you disturbed me, I wish the devil had taken you.' "'My boy,' said Caderousse sententiously, "'one can talk while eating, "'and then, you ungrateful being, "'you are not pleased to see an old friend?' I am weeping with joy. He was truly crying, but it would have been difficult to say whether joy or the onions produced the greatest effect on the lacrimal glands of the old innkeeper of the Pont du Gard. Hold your tongue, you hypocrite, said Andrea. You love me? Yes, I do, or make the devil take me. I know it is a weakness, said Caderousse, but it overpowers me. "'and yet it has not prevented your sending for me to play me some trick.' "'Come,' said Caderousse, wiping his large knife on his apron. "'If I do not like you, do you think I should endure the wretched life you lead me? "'Think for a moment. You have your servant clothes on. You therefore keep a servant. "'I have none, and am obliged to prepare my own meals. "'You abuse my cookery because you dine at the table d'hôte of the Hôtel des Princes or the Café de Paris. "'Well, I too could keep a servant. I too could have a tilbury. "'I too could dine where I like. But why do I not? "'Because I would not annoy my little Benedetto. "'Come, just acknowledge that I could, eh?' "'This address was accompanied by a look which was by no means difficult to understand. "'Well,' said Andrea, "'Admitting your love, why do you want me to breakfast with you?' "'That I may have the pleasure of seeing you, my little fellow. "'What is the use of seeing me after we have made all our arrangements?' "'Hey, dear friend,' said Caderousse, "'our wills ever made without codicils. "'But you first came to breakfast, did you not? "'Well, sit down and let us begin with these pilchards and this fresh butter, "'which I have put on some vine leaves to please you, wicked one.' Ah, yes, you look at my room, my four straw chairs, my image, three francs each. But what do you expect? This is not the Hôtel des Princes. Come, you are growing discontented. You are no longer happy. 
You, who only wish to live like a retired baker. Caderousse sighed. Well, what have you to say? You have seen your dream realized. I can still say it is a dream. A retired baker, my poor Benedetto, is rich. He has an annuity. Well, you have an annuity. I have? Yes, since I bring you your two hundred francs. Caderousse shrugged his shoulders. It is humiliating, said he, thus to receive money given grudgingly, an uncertain supply which may soon fail. You see, I am obliged to economize, in case your prosperity should cease. Well, my friend, fortune is inconstant, as the chaplain of the regiment said. I know your prosperity is great, you rascal. You are to marry the daughter of Donglar. What? Of Donglar? Yes, to be sure. Must I say Baron Donglar? I might as well say Count Benedetto. He was an old friend of mine, and if he had not so bad a memory, he ought to invite me to your wedding, seeing he came to mine. Yes, yes, to mine. God, he was not so proud then. He was an underclerk to the good Monsieur Morel. I have dined many times with him and the Count of Morcerf. So you see, I have some high connections, and were I to cultivate them a little, we might meet in the same drawing-rooms. Come, your jealousy represents everything to you in the wrong light. That is all very fine, Benedetto mio, but I know what I am saying. Perhaps I may one day put on my best coat, and, presenting myself at the great gate, introduce myself. Meanwhile, let us sit down and eat. Caderousse set the example and attacked the breakfast with good appetite, praising each dish he set before his visitor. The latter seemed to have resigned himself. He drew the corks and partook largely of the fish with the garlic and fat. "'Ah, mate,' said Caderousse, "'you are getting on better terms with your old landlord.' "'Faith, yes,' replied Andrea, whose hunger prevailed over every other feeling. "'So you like it, you rogue?' So much that I wonder how a man who can cook thus can complain of hard living. Do you see, said Caderousse, all my happiness is marred by one thought. And what is that? That I am dependent on another, I who have always gained my own livelihood honestly. Do not let that disturb you. I have enough for two. No, truly, uh, you may believe me if you will. At the end of every month I am tormented by remorse. Good Caderousse! So much so that yesterday I would not take the two hundred francs. Yes, you wish to speak to me. But was it indeed remorse? Tell me. True remorse, and besides, an idea had struck me. Andrea shuddered. He always did so at Caderousse's ideas. It is miserable, do you see? Always to wait till the end of the month. Oh, said Andrea philosophically, determined to watch his companion narrowly. Does not life pass in waiting? Do I, for instance, fare better? Well, I wait patiently, do I not? Yes, because instead of expecting two hundred wretched francs, you expect five or six thousand, perhaps ten, perhaps even twelve, for you take care not to let anyone know the utmost. Down there, you always had little presents and Christmas boxes which you tried to hide from your poor friend Caderousse. Fortunately, he is a cunning fellow, that friend Caderousse. There, you are beginning again to ramble, to talk again and again of the past. But what is the use of teasing me with going all over that again? Ah, you are only one and twenty and can forget the past. I am fifty, and am obliged to recollect it. But let us return to business. Yes. I was going to say, if I were in your place. Well? I would realize. How would you realize? I would ask for six months in advance, under pretense of being able to purchase a farm. Then with my six months I would decamp. Well, well, said Andrea. That isn't a bad idea. My dear friend, said Caderousse. Eat of my bread and take my advice. You'll be none the worse off, physically or morally. 
But, said Andrea, why do you not act on the advice you gave me? Why do you not realize a six months, a year's advance even, and retire to Brussels? Instead of leaving the retired baker, you might live as a bankrupt, using his privileges that would be very good. But how the devil would you have me retire on twelve hundred francs? Ah, Caderousse, said Andrea, how covetous you are. Two months ago you were dying with hunger. The appetite grows by what it feeds on said Caderousse, grinning, and showing his teeth like a monkey, laughing or a tiger growling. And, added he, biting off with his large white teeth an enormous mouthful of bread, I have formed a plan. Caderousse's plans alarmed Andrea still more than his ideas. Ideas were but the germ. The plan was reality. Let me see your plan. I dare say it is a pretty one. Why not? who formed the plan by which we left the establishment of... Eh, was it not I, and was no bad one, I believe, since here we are? I do not say, replied Andrea, that you never make a good one, but let us see your plan. Well, pursued Caderousse, can you, without expending one sou, put me in the way of getting fifteen thousand francs? No, fifteen thousand are not enough. I cannot again become an honest man with less than thirty thousand francs. No, replied Andrea dryly. No, I cannot. I do not think you understand me, replied Caderousse calmly. I said without your laying out a sou. Do you want me to commit a robbery, to spoil all my good fortune and yours with mine, and both of us to be dragged down there again? It would make very little difference to me said Caderousse. If I were retaken, I am a poor creature to live alone, and sometimes pine for my old comrades, not like you, artless creature, who would be glad never to see them again. Andrea did more than tremble this time. He turned pale. Come, Caderousse, no nonsense, said he. Don't alarm yourself, my little Benedetto. But to just point out to me some means of gaining those thirty thousand francs without your assistance, and I will contrive it. Well, I'll see. I'll try to contrive some way, said Andrea. Meanwhile, you raise my monthly allowance to five hundred francs, my little fellow. I have a fancy and mean to get a housekeeper. Well, you shall have your five hundred francs, said Andrea. But it is very hard for me, my poor Caderousse. If you take advantage. Ah, said Caderousse, when you have access to countless stores. One would have said André anticipated his companion's words. So did his eye flash like lightning. But it was but for a moment. True, he replied, and my protector is very kind. That dear protector, said Caderousse, and how much does he give you monthly? Five thousand francs. As many thousands as you give me hundreds. Truly, it is only bastards who are thus fortunate. Five thousand francs per month. What the devil can you do with all that? Oh, it is no trouble to spend that. And I'm like you, I want capital. Capital. Yes, I understand. Everyone would like capital. Well, and I shall get it. Who will give it to you? Your prince? Yes, my prince, but unfortunately I must wait. You must wait for what? asked Caderousse. For his death. The death of your prince? Yes. How so? Because he has made his will in my favour. Indeed. On my honour. For how much? For five hundred thousand. Only that? It's little enough. But so it is. No, it cannot be. Are you my friend, Caderousse? Yes, in life or death. Well, I will tell you a secret. What is it? But remember. Ah, pardieu, mute as a carp. Well, I think. Andrea stopped and looked around. You think? Do not fear, pardieu, we are alone. I think I have discovered my father. Your true father? Yes. Not old Cavalcanti? 
No, for he has gone again. The true one, as you say. And what father is? Well, Cadarus, it is Monte Cristo. <laughs> yes, you understand, that explains all. He cannot acknowledge me openly, it appears, but he does it through Monsieur Cavalcanti, and gives him fifty thousand francs for it. Fifty thousand francs for being your father? I would have done it for half that, for twenty thousand, for fifteen thousand. Why did you not think of me, ungrateful man? Did I know anything about it, when it was all done when I was down there? Ah, truly, and you say that by his will, he leaves me five hundred thousand livres. Are you sure of it? He showed it to me. But that is not all. There is a codicil, as I said just now. Probably. And in that codicil he acknowledges me. Oh, the good father, the brave father, the very honest father, said Cadarus, twirling a plate in the air between his two hands. Now say if I conceal anything from you. No, and your confidence makes your honourable in my opinion, and your princely father, is he rich? Very rich? Yes, he is that. He does not himself know the amount of his fortune. Is it possible? It is evident enough to me, who am always at his house. The other day a banker's clerk brought him fifty thousand francs in a portfolio about the size of your plate. Yesterday his banker brought him a hundred thousand francs in gold. Caderousse was filled with wonder. The young man's words sounded to him like metal, and he thought he could hear the rushing of cascades of Louis. "'And you go into that house?' cried he briskly. "'When I like.' Caderousse was thoughtful for a moment. It was easy to perceive he was revolving some unfortunate idea in his mind. Then suddenly, "'How I should like to see all that!' cried he. How beautiful it must be! It is, in fact, a magnificent, said Andrea. And does he not live in the Champs Elysees? Yes, a number thirty. Ah, said Cadorus. Numero trente. Yes, a fine house standing alone between a courtyard and a garden. You must know it. Possibly, but it is not the exterior I care for, it is the interior. What beautiful furniture there must be in it. Have you ever seen the Tuileries? No. Well, it surpasses that. It must be worth one's while to stoop, Andrea, when that good Monsieur Monte Cristo lets fall his purse. It is not worth while to wait for that, said Andrea. Money is as plentiful in that house as fruit in an orchard. But you should take me there one day with you. How can I? On what plea? You are right, but you have made my mouth water. I must absolutely see it. I shall find a way. No nonsense, Cadarus. I will offer myself as floor polisher. The rooms are all carpeted. Well, then, I must be contented to imagine it. That is the best plan, believe me. Try at least to give me an idea of what it is. How can I? Nothing is easier. Is it large? Middling. How is it arranged? Faith, I should require pen, ink, and paper to make a plan. They are all here, said Cadarus briskly. He fetched from an old secretary a sheet of white paper and pen and ink. Here, said Cadarus. Draw me all that on the paper, my boy. Andrea took the pen with an imperceptible smile and began. The house, as I said, is between the court and the garden. In this way, do you see? Andrea drew the garden, the court, and the house. High walls? Not more than eight or ten feet. That is not prudent, said Cadarus. In the court are orange trees in pots, turf, and clumps of flowers. And no steel traps? No. The stables? are on either side of the gate, which you see there. And Andrea continued his plan. Let us see the ground floor, said Cadarus. On the ground floor, dining room, two drawing rooms, billiard rooms, staircase in the hall, and a little black staircase. Windows? 
magnificent windows, so beautiful, so large, that I believe a man of your size should pass through each frame. Why the devil have they any stairs with such windows? Luxury has everything. But shutters? Yes, but they are never used. That Count of Monte Cristo is an original who loves to look at the sky, even at night. And where do the servants sleep? Oh, they have a house to themselves. Picture to yourself a pretty coach house at the right hand side where the ladders are kept. Well, over that coach house are the servants' rooms with bells corresponding with the different apartments. Ah, diable! Bells, did you say? What do you mean? Oh, nothing. I only say they cost a load of money to hang. And what is the use of them, I should like to know? There used to be a dog let loose in the yard at night, but it has been taken to the house at Auteuil, to that you went to, you know. Yes. I was saying to him only yesterday, You are imprudent, Monsieur Count, for when you go to Auteuil and take your servants, the house is left unprotected. Well, said he, what next? Well, next some day you will be robbed. What did he answer? He quietly said, What do I care if I am? Andrea, he has some secretary with a spring. How do you know? Yes, which catches the thief in a trap and plays a tune. I was told there was such at the last exhibition. He has a simple, a mahogany secretary in which the key is always kept. And he is not robbed? No, his servants are all devoted to him. There ought to be some money in that secretary. There may be. No one knows what there is. And where is it? On the first floor. Sketch me the plan of that floor, as you have done of the ground floor, my boy. That is very simple. Andrea took the pen. On the first story, do you see, there is the anteroom and the drawing room. To the right of the drawing room, a library and a study. To the left, a bedroom and a dressing room. The famous secretary is in the dressing room. Is there a window in the dressing room? Two. One here and one there. Andrea sketched two windows in the room, which formed an angle on the plan, and appeared as a small square added to the rectangle of the bedroom. Caderousse became thoughtful. Does he often go to a toy? added he. Two or three times a week. Tomorrow, for instance. He is going to spend the day and night there. Are you sure of it? He has invited me to dine there. There's a life for you, said Caderousse. A townhouse and a country house. That is what it is to be rich. And shall you dine there? Probably. When you dine there, do you sleep there? If I like, I am at home there. Caderousse looked at the young man as if to get at the truth from the bottom of his heart. But Andrea drew a cigar case from his pocket, took a Havana, quietly lit it, and began smoking. When do you want your twelve hundred francs? said he to Caderousse. Now, if you have them. Andrea took five and twenty louis from his pocket. Yellow boys, said Caderousse. No, I thank you. Oh, you despise them. On the contrary, I esteem them, but will not have them. You can change them, idiot. Gold is worth five sous. Exactly. And he who changes them will follow friend Caderousse, lay hands on him, and demand what farmers pay him their rent in gold. No nonsense, my good fellow, silver simply, round coins with the head of some monarch or other on them. Anybody may possess a five-franc piece. But do you suppose I carry five hundred francs about with me? I should want a porter. Well, leave them with your porter. He is to be trusted. I will call for them. Today? No, tomorrow. I shall not have time today. Well, tomorrow I will leave them when I go to Auteuil. May I depend on it? Certainly. Because I shall secure my housekeeper on the strength of it. Now see here. Will that be all? And will you not torment me any more? Never. Caderousse had become so gloomy that Andrea feared he should be obliged to notice the change. 
he redoubled his gaiety and carelessness. "'How sprightly you are,' said Caderousse. "'One would say you are already in possession of your property.' "'No, unfortunately. But when I do obtain it—' "'Well?' "'I shall remember old friends, I can tell you that.' "'Yes, since you have such a good memory.' "'What do you want? It looks as if you are trying to fleece me.' "'I? What an idea!' I, who am going to give you another piece of good advice. What is it? To leave behind you the diamond you have on your finger. We shall both get into trouble. You will ruin both yourself and me by your folly. How so? said Andrea. How? You put on a livery, you disguise yourself as a servant, and yet keep a diamond on your finger worth four or five thousand francs. You guess well. I know something of diamonds. I have had some. You do well to boast of it, said Andrea, who, without becoming angry, as Caderousse feared, at this new extortion, quietly resigned the ring. Caderousse looked so closely at it that Andrea well knew that he was examining to see if all the edges were perfect. It is a false diamond, said Caderousse. You are joking now, replied Andrea. "'Do not be angry. We can try it.' Caderousse went to the window, touched the glass with it, and found it would cut. "'Confiture,' said Caderousse, putting the diamond on his little finger. "'I was mistaken. But those thieves of jewellers imitate so well that it is no longer worth while to rob a jeweller's shop. It is another branch of industry paralysed.' "'Have you finished?' said Andrea. "'Do you want anything more?' Will you have my waistcoat or my hat? Make free, now you have begun. No, you are, after all, a good companion. I will not detain you, and will try to cure myself of my ambition. But take care the same thing does not happen to you in selling the diamond you feared, with the gold. I shall not sell it. Do not fear. Not at least until the day after tomorrow, thought the young man. A rogue said Caderousse. You are going to find your servants, your horses, your carriage, and your betrothed. Yes, said Andrea. Well, I hope you will make a handsome wedding present the day you marry Mademoiselle Donglar. I have already told you it is a fancy you have taken in your head. What fortune has she? But I tell you. A million? Andrea shrugged his shoulders. Let it be a million, said Caderousse. You can never have so much as I wish you. Thank you, said the young man. Oh, I wish it you with all my heart, added Caderousse with his hoarse laugh. Stop, let me show you the way. It is not worth while. Yes, it is. Why? Because there is a little secret, a precaution I thought it desirable to take. One of Ure Efficet's locks, revised and improved by Gaspar Caderousse, I will manufacture you a similar one when you are a capitalist. Thank you, said Andrea. I will let you know a week beforehand. They parted. Caderousse remained on the landing until he had not only seen Andrea go down the three stories, but also across the court. Then he returned hastily, shut his door carefully, and began to study like a clever architect the plan Andrea had left him. Dear Benedetto, said he, I think he will not be sorry to inherit his fortune, and he who hastens the day when he can touch his five hundred thousand will not be his worst friend. End of chapter 81「Chapter 82 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 82. The Burglary. The day following that on which the conversation we have related took place, the Count of Monte Cristo set out for Auteuil, accompanied by Ali and several attendants, and also taking with him some horses whose qualities he was desirous of ascertaining. He was induced to undertake this journey, of which the day before he had not even thought, and which had not occurred to Andrea either, 
by the arrival of Bertuccio from Normandy with intelligence respecting the house and sloop. The house was ready, and the sloop, which had arrived a week before, lay at anchor in a small creek with her crew of six men, who had observed all the requisite formalities, and were ready again to put to sea. The Count praised Bertuccio's zeal, and ordered him to prepare for a speedy departure, as his stay in France would not be prolonged more than a month. Now, said he, I may require to go in one night from Paris to Treport. Let eight fresh horses be in readiness on the road, which will enable me to go fifty leagues in ten hours. Your Highness has already expressed that wish, said Bertuccio, and the horses are ready. I have bought them and stationed them myself at the most desirable posts, that is, in villages where no one generally stops. That's well, said Monte Cristo. I remain here a day or two. Arrange accordingly. As Bertuccio was leaving the room to give the requisite orders, Baptistin opened the door. He held a letter on a silver waiter. "'What are you doing here?' asked the Count, seeing him covered with dust. "'I did not send for you, I think.' Baptistin, without answering, approached the Count and presented the letter. "'Important and urgent,' said he. The Count opened the letter and read, "'Monsieur de Monte Cristo is apprised that this night a man will enter his house in the Champs-Élysées with the intention of carrying off some papers supposed to be in the secretary in the dressing-room. The Count's well-known courage will render unnecessary the aid of the police, whose interference might seriously affect him who sends this advice. The Count, by any opening from the bedroom, or by concealing himself in the dressing-room, would be able to defend his property himself. Many attendants or apparent precautions would prevent the villain from the attempt, and Monsieur de Monte Cristo would lose the opportunity of discovering an enemy whom chance has revealed to him who now sends this warning to the Count, a warning he might not be able to send another time, if this first attempt should fail and another be made. The Count's first idea was that this was an artifice, a gross deception to draw his attention from a minor danger in order to expose him to a greater. He was on the point of sending the letter to the commissary of police, notwithstanding the advice of his anonymous friend, or perhaps because of that advice, when suddenly the idea occurred to him that it might be some personal enemy whom he alone should recognise and over whom, if such were the case, he alone would gain any advantage, as Fiesco had done over the Moor who would have killed him. We know the Count's vigorous and daring mind, denying anything to be impossible, with that energy which marks the great man, from his past life, from his resolution to shrink from nothing, the Count had acquired an inconceivable relish for the contests in which he had engaged, sometimes against nature, that is to say, against God, and sometimes against the world, that is, against the devil. "'They do not want my papers,' said Monte Cristo. "'They want to kill me. They are no robbers but assassins.' I will not allow the prefect or police to interfere with my private affairs. I am rich enough, forsooth, to distribute his authority on this occasion. The Count recalled Baptistin, who had left the room after delivering the letter. Return to Paris, said he. Assemble the servants who remain there. I want all my household at Auteuil. But will no one remain in the house, my lord? asked Baptistin. Yes, the porter. My lord will remember that the lodge is at a distance from the house. Well? The house might be stripped without his hearing the least noise. By whom? By thieves. You are a fool, Monsieur Baptistin. Thieves might strip the house. It would annoy me less than to be disobeyed. Baptistin bowed. You understand me? said the Count. Bring your comrades here one and all, but let everything remain as usual. Only close the shutters of the ground floor. And those of the second floor? You know they are never closed. Go. The Count signified his intention of dining alone, and that no one but Ali should attend him. 
Having dined with his usual tranquillity and moderation, the Count, making a signal to Ali to follow him, went out by the side gate, and on reaching the Bois de Boulogne, turned apparently without design towards Paris, and at twilight found himself opposite his house in the Champs-Élysées. All was dark. One solitary, feeble light was burning in the porter's lodge, about forty paces distant from the house, as Baptistin has said. Monte Cristo leaned against a tree, and with that scrutinizing glance which was so rarely deceived, looked up and down the avenue, examined the passers-by, and carefully looked down the neighboring streets to see that no one was concealed. Ten minutes passed thus, and he was convinced that no one was watching him. He hastened to the side door with Ali, entered hurriedly, and by the servant's staircase of which she had the key, gained his bedroom without opening or disarranging a single curtain, without even the porter having the slightest suspicion that the house, which he supposed empty, contained its chief occupant. Arrived in his bedroom, the Count motioned to Ali to stop. Then he passed into the dressing-room which he examined. Everything appeared as usual, the precious secretary in its place, and the key in the secretary. He double-locked it, took the key, returned to the bedroom door, removed the double staple of the bolt, and went in. Meanwhile, Ali had procured the arms the Count required, namely a short carbine and a pair of double-barrelled pistols, with which as sure an aim might be taken as with a single-barrelled one. Thus armed, the Count held the lives of five men in his hands. It was about half-past nine. The Count and Ali ate in haste a crust of bread and drank a glass of Spanish wine. Then Monte Cristo slipped aside one of the movable panels which enabled him to see into the adjoining room. He had within his reach his pistols and carbine, and Ali, standing near him, held one of the small Arabian hatchets, whose form has not varied since the Crusades. Through one of the windows of the bedroom, on a line with that in the dressing-room, the Count could see into the street. Two hours passed thus. It was intensely dark. Still, Ali, thanks to his wild nature and the Count, thanks doubtless to his long confinement, could distinguish in the darkness the slightest movement of the trees. The little light in the lodge had long been extinct. It might be expected that the attack, if indeed an attack was projected, would be made from the staircase of the ground floor and not from a window. In Monte Cristo's opinion, the villains sought his life, not his money. It would be his bedroom they would attack, and they must reach it by the back staircase or by the window in the dressing-room. The clock of the Invalide struck a quarter to twelve. The west wind bore on its moistened gusts the doleful vibration of the three strokes. As the last stroke died away, the Count thought he heard a slight noise in the dressing-room. This first sound, or rather this first grinding, was followed by a second, then a third. At the fourth, the Count knew what to expect. A firm and well-practised hand was engaged in cutting the four sides of a pane of glass with a diamond. The Count felt his heart beat more rapidly. Inured as men may be to danger, forewarned as they may be of peril, they understand by the fluttering of the heart and the shuddering of the frame the enormous difference between a dream and a reality, between the project and the execution. However, Monte Cristo only made a sign to apprise Ali, who, understanding that danger was approaching from the other side, drew nearer to his master. Monte Cristo was eager to ascertain the strength and number of his enemies. The window whence the noise proceeded was opposite the opening by which the Count could see into the dressing-room. He fixed his eyes on that window. He distinguished a shadow in the darkness. Then one of the panes became quite opaque, as if a sheet of paper was stuck on the outside. Then the square cracked without falling. Through the opening an arm was passed to find the fastening. Then a second. The window turned on its hinges, and the man entered. He was alone. "'That's a daring rascal,' whispered the Count. At that moment, Ali touched him slightly on the shoulder. 
He turned. Ali pointed to the window of the room in which they were facing the street. I see, said he. There are two of them. One does the work while the other stands guard. He made a sign to Ali not to lose sight of the man in the street and turned to the one in the dressing room. The glass cutter had entered and he was feeling his way, his arms stretched out before him. At last, he appeared to have made himself familiar with his surroundings. There were two doors. He bolted them both. When he drew near to the bedroom door, Monte Cristo expected that he was coming in and raised one of his pistols, but he simply heard the sound of the bolts sliding in their copper rings. It was only a precaution. The nocturnal visitor, ignorant of the fact that the Count had removed the staples, might now think himself at home and pursue his purpose with full security. Alone and free to act as he wished, the man then drew from his pocket something which the Count could not discern, placed it on a stand, then went straight to the secretary, felt the lock, and, contrary to his expectation, found that the key was missing. But the glass cutter was a prudent man who had provided for all emergencies. The Count soon heard the rattling of a bunch of skeleton keys, such as the locksmith brings when called to force a lock, and which thieves call nightingales, doubtless from the music of their nightly song when they grind against the bolt. Aha! whispered Monte Cristo with a smile of disappointment. He is only a thief. But the man in the dark could not find the right key. He reached the instrument he had placed on the stand, touched a spring and immediately a pale light, just bright enough to render objects distinct, was reflected on his hands and countenance. By heavens! exclaimed Monte Cristo, starting back. It is. Ali raised his hatchet. Don't stir whispered Monte Cristo, and put down your hatchet. We shall require no arms. Then he added some words in a low tone, for the exclamation which surprise had drawn from the Count, faint as it had been, had startled the man who remained in the pose of the old knife-grinder. It was an order the Count had just given, for immediately Ali went noiselessly and returned bearing a black dress and a three-cornered hat. Meanwhile, Monte Cristo had rapidly taken off his greatcoat, waistcoat, and shirt, and one might distinguish by the glimmering through the open panel that he wore a pliant tunic of steel mail, of which the last in France, where daggers are no longer dreaded, was worn by King Louis XVI, who feared the dagger at his breast, and whose head was cleft with a hatchet. The tunic soon disappeared under a long cassock, as did his hair under a priest's wig. The three-cornered hat over this effectually transformed the Count into an abbé. The man, hearing nothing more, stood erect, and while Monte Cristo was completing his disguise, had advanced straight to the secretary, whose lock was beginning to crack under his nightingale. "'Try again,' whispered the Count, who depended on the secret spring, which was unknown to the picklock, clever as he might be. "'Try again. You have a few minutes' work there.' and he advanced to the window. The man whom he had seen seated on a fence had got down, and was still pacing the street. But strange as it appeared, he cared not for those who might pass from the avenue of the Champs-Élysées or by the Faubourg Saint-Honoré. His attention was engrossed with what was passing at the Count's, and his only aim appeared to be to discern every movement in the dressing-room. Monte Cristo suddenly struck his finger on his forehead, and a smile passed over his lips. Then drawing near to Ali, he whispered, Remain here, concealed in the dark, and whatever noise you hear, whatever passes, only come in or show yourself if I call you. Ali bowed in token of strict obedience. Monte Cristo then drew a lighted taper from a closet, and when the thief was deeply engaged with his lock, silently opened the door, taking care that the light should shine directly on his face. The door opened so quietly that the thief heard no sound, but to his astonishment the room was suddenly illuminated. He turned. "'Ah, good evening, my dear Monsieur Caderousse,' said Monte Cristo. "'What are you doing here at such an hour?' "'The Abbe Boussoni, exclaimed Caderousse and, not knowing how this strange apparition could have entered when he had bolted the doors, 
he let fall his bunch of keys and remained motionless and stupefied. The Count placed himself between Calarus and the window, thus cutting off from the thief his only chance of retreat. "'The Abbé Boussoni,' repeated Calarus, fixing his haggard gaze on the Count. "'Yes, undoubtedly, the Abbé Boussoni himself,' replied Monte Cristo. "'And I am very glad you recognize me, dear Monsieur Calarus. It proves you have a good memory, for it must be about ten years since we last met.' This calmness of Boussoni, combined with his irony and boldness, staggered Hadarus. "'The Abbé! The Abbé!' murmured he, clinching his fists and his teeth chattering. "'So you would rob the Count of Monte Cristo,' continued the false Abbé. "'Reverend sir,' murmured Hadarus, seeking to regain the window which the Count pitilessly blocked. "'Reverend sir, I don't know. Believe me, I take my oath.' "'A pane of glass out,' continued the Count. "'A dark lantern, a bunch of false keys, a secretary half-forced. "'It is tolerably evident.' "'Calarus was choking. "'He looked around for some corner to hide in, some way of escape. "'Come, come,' continued the Count. "'I see you are still the same. "'An assassin.' "'I ran, sir, since you know everything.' You know, it was not I, it was La Caconte that was proved at the trial since I was only condemned to the galleys. Is your time then expired, since I find you in a fair way to return there? No, Reverend Sir, I have been liberated by someone. That someone has done society a great kindness. Ah, said Cadorus, I had promised. And you are breaking your promise interrupted Monte Cristo. Alas, yes, said Cadarus very uneasily. A bad relapse that will lead you, if I mistake not, to the Place de Grève. So much the worse, so much the worse, diavolo, as they say in my country. Reverend sir, I am impelled. Every criminal says the same thing. Poverty. Pah, said Bessoni disdainfully. Poverty may make a man beg, steal a loaf of bread at a beggar's door, but not cause him to open a secretary in a house supposed to be inhabited. And when the jeweller Johannes had just paid you forty thousand francs for the diamond I had given you, and you killed him to get the diamond and the money both, was that also poverty? Pardon, reverend sir, said Cadorus, you have saved my life once. Save me again. That is but poor encouragement. Are you alone, Reverend Sir, or have you there soldiers ready to seize me? I am alone, said the Abbe, and I will again have pity on you, and will let you escape at the risk of the fresh miseries my weakness may lead to, if you tell me the truth. Ah, Reverend Sir, cried Cadarus, clasping his hands and drawing nearer to Monte Cristo, I may indeed say, you are my deliverer. You mean to say you have been freed from confinement? Yes, that is true, reverend sir. Who was your liberator? An Englishman. What was his name? Lord Wilmore. I know him. I shall know if you lie. Ah, reverend sir, I tell you the simple truth. Was this Englishman protecting you? No, no, not me, but a young Corsican, my companion. What was this Corsican's name? Benedetto. Is that his Christian name? He had no other. He was a foundling. Then this young man escaped with you? He did. In what way? We were working at Sir saint mondrier near Toulon. Do you know saint mondrier I do. In the hour of rest between noon and one o'clock. Galley slaves have a nap after dinner. We may well pity the poor fellows, said the abbe. Nay, said Cadorus, one can't always work. One is not a dog. So much the better for the dogs, said Monte Cristo. While the rest slept, then we went away a short distance. We severed our fetters with a file the Englishman had given us. 
and swam away. And what is become of this Benedetto? I don't know. You ought to know. No, in truth, we parted that year. And to give more weight to his protestation, Caderousse advanced another step towards the abbé, who remained motionless in his place as calm as ever, and pursuing his interrogation. You lie, said the abbé Boussoni, with a tone of irresistible authority. Reverend sir. You lie. This man is still your friend. And you, perhaps, make use of him as your accomplice. Oh, reverend sir. Since you left Toulon, what have you lived on? Answer me. On what I could get. You lie, repeated the abbé a third time, with a still more imperative tone. Caderousse, terrified, looked at the Count. You have lived on the money he has given you. True, said Caderousse. Benedetto has become the son of a great lord. How can he be the son of a great lord? A natural son. And what is that great lord's name? The Count of Monte Cristo, the very same in whose house we are in. Benedetto, the Count's son, replied Monte Cristo, astonished in his turn. Well, I should think so. Since the Count has found him a false father, since the Count gives him four thousand francs a month, and leaves him five hundred thousand francs in his will. Ah, yes, said the fictitious abbe, who began to understand. And what a name does the young man bear meanwhile? Andrea Cavalcanti. Is it then that young man whom my friend the Count of Monte Cristo has received into his house, and who is going to marry Mademoiselle Donglard? Exactly. And you suffer that, you wretch, you who know his life and his crime. Why should I stand in a comrade's way? said Caderousse. You are right. It is not you who should apprise Monsieur Donglar. It is I. I do not do so, reverend sir. Why not? Because you would bring us to ruin. And you think that to save such villains as you, I will become an abettor of their plot, an accomplice in their crimes? Reverend sir, said Caderousse, drawing still nearer, I will expose all. To whom? To Monsieur Danglars. By heaven, cried Caderousse, drawing from his waistcoat an open knife and striking the count in the breast. You shall disclose nothing, reverend sir. To Caderousse's great astonishment, the knife, instead of piercing the Count's breast, flew back blunted. At the same moment, the Count seized with his left hand the assassin's wrist and wrung it with such strength that the knife fell from his stiffened fingers and Caderousse uttered a cry of pain. But the Count, disregarding his cry, continued to wring the bandit's wrist until his arm being dislocated, he fell first on his knees, then flat on the floor. The Count then placed his foot on his head, saying, I now know what restrains me from crushing the skull, rascal. Oh, mercy, mercy, cried Caderousse. The Count withdrew his foot. Rise, said he. Caderousse rose. What a wrist you have, reverend sir, said Caderousse, stroking his arm, all bruised by the fleshy pincers which had held it. What a wrist! Silence! God gives me strength to overcome a wild beast like you. In the name of that God I act, remember that wretch, and to spare thee at this moment is still serving him. Oh, said Caderousse, groaning with pain, take this pen and paper, and write what I dictate. I don't know how to write, reverend sir. You lie. Take this pen and write. Caderousse, awed by the superior power of the abbé, sat down and wrote. Sir, the man whom you are receiving at your house and to whom you intend to marry your daughter is a felon who escaped with me from confinement at Toulon. He was number 59 and I number 58. He was called Benedetto, but he is ignorant of his real name, having never known his parents. 
Sign it, continued the Count. But you would ruin me. If I sought your ruin, fool, I should drag you to the first guardhouse. Besides, when that note is delivered, in all probability you will have no more to fear. Sign it. Caderousse signed it. The address. To Monsieur the Baron d'Anglars, Banca, Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin. Caderousse wrote the address. The abbé took the note. Now, said he, that suffices. Be gone. Which way? The way you came. You wish me to get out at the window? You got in very well. Oh, you have some design against me, reverend sir. Idiot, what design can I have? Why then, not let me out of the door? What would be the advantage of waking the porter? Ah, reverend sir, tell me, do you wish me dead? I wish what God wills. But swear that you will not strike me as I go down. Cowardly fool! What do you intend doing with me? I ask you what can I do? I have tried to make you a happy man, and you have turned out a murderer. Oh, monsieur, said Caderousse, make one more attempt. Try me once more. I will, said the Count. Listen, you know if I may be relied on. Yes, said Caderousse. If you arrive safely at home, what have I to fear except from you? If you reach your home safely, leave Paris, leave France, and wherever you may be, so long as you conduct yourself well, I will send you a small annuity. For if you return home safely, then... Then? asked Caderousse, shuddering. Then I shall believe God has forgiven you, and I will forgive you too. As true as I am a Christian, stammered Caderousse, you will make me to die of fright. Now be gone, said the Count, pointing to the window. Caderousse, scarcely yet relying on this promise, put his legs out of the window and stood on the ladder. Now go down, said the abbé, folding his arms. Understanding he had nothing more to fear from him, Caderousse began to go down. Then the Count brought the taper to the window, that it might be seen in the Champs-Élysées, that a man was getting out of the window while another held a light. What are you doing, reverend sir? Suppose a watchman should pass. And he blew out the light. He then descended, but it was only when he felt his foot touch the ground that he was satisfied of his safety. Monte Cristo returned to his bedroom and glancing rapidly from the garden to the street, he saw first Caderousse, who after walking to the end of the garden, fixed his ladder against the wall at a different part from where he came in. The Count, then looking over into the street, saw the man who appeared to be waiting run in the same direction and place himself against the angle of the wall where Caderousse would come over. Caderousse climbed the ladder slowly and looked over the coping to see if the street was quiet. No one could be seen or heard. The clock of the Invalide struck one. Then Caderousse sat astride the coping and, drawing up his ladder, passed it over the wall. Then he began to descend, or rather to slide down by the two stanchions, which he did with an ease which proved how accustomed he was to the exercise. But once started, he could not stop. In vain did he see a man start from the shadow when he was halfway down. In vain did he see an arm raised as he touched the ground. Before he could defend himself, that arm struck him so violently in the back that he let go the ladder, crying, Help! A second blow struck him almost immediately in the side, and he fell, calling, Help! Murder! Then, as he rolled on the ground, his adversary seized him by the hair and struck him a third blow in the chest. This time, Caderousse endeavoured to call again, but he could only utter a groan, and he shuddered as the blood flowed from his three wounds. The assassin, finding that he no longer cried out, lifted his head up by the hair. His eyes were closed and the mouth was distorted. The murderer, supposing him dead, let fall his head and disappeared. Then Caderousse, feeling that he was leaving him, raised himself on his elbow and with a dying voice cried with great effort, Murder! I am dying! Help! Reverend sir! Help! 
this mournful appeal pierced the darkness. The door of the back staircase opened, then the side gate of the garden, and Ali and his master were on the spot with lights. End of chapter 82Chapter 83 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 83 The Hand of God. Caderousse continued to call piteously Help! Reverend Sir, help! What is the matter? asked Monte Cristo. Help! cried Caderousse. I am murdered! We are here. Take courage. Oh, it's all over. You are come too late. You are come to see me die. What blows, what blood. He fainted. Ali and his master conveyed the wounded man into a room. Monte Cristo motioned to Ali to undress him, and he then examined his dreadful wounds. My God, he exclaimed, thy vengeance is sometimes delayed but only that it may fall the more effectually. Ali looked at his master for further instructions. Bring here immediately the king's attorney, Monsieur de Villefort, who lives in the Faubourg Saint-Honoré. As you pass the lodge, wake the porter and send him for a surgeon. Ali obeyed, leaving the abbé alone with Caderousse, who had not yet revived. When the wretched man again opened his eyes, the Count looked at him with a mournful expression of pity, and his lips moved as if in prayer. "'A surgeon, reverend sir, a surgeon,' said Caderousse. "'I have sent for one,' replied the Abbé. "'I know he cannot save my life, but he may strengthen me to give my evidence.' "'Against whom?' "'Against my murderer.' Did you recognize him? Yes, it was Benedetto. The young Corsican? Himself. Your comrade? Yes, after giving me the plan of his house, doubtless hoping I should kill the Count and he thus become his heir, or that the Count would kill me and I should be out of his way, he waylaid me and has murdered me. I have also sent to the procureur. He will not come in time. I feel my life fast ebbing. Wait a moment, said Monte Cristo. He left the room and returned in five minutes with a file. The dying man's eyes were all the time riveted on the door, through which he hoped succour would arrive. Hasten, reverend sir, hasten, I shall faint again. Monte Cristo approached and dropped on his purple lips three or four drops of the contents of the file. Caderousse drew a deep breath. Oh, said he, that is life to me. More, more. Two drops more would kill you, replied the abbé. Oh, send for someone to whom I can denounce the wretch. Shall I write your deposition? You can sign it. Yes, yes said Caderousse, and his eyes glistened at the thought of this posthumous revenge. Monte Cristo wrote, I die, murdered by the Corsican Benedetto, my comrade in the galleys at Toulouse, numero 59. Quick, quick, said Caderousse, or I shall be unable to sign it. Monte Cristo gave the pen to Caderousse, who collected all his strength, signed it, and fell back on his bed, saying, You will relate all the rest, reverend sir. You will say he calls himself Andrea Cavalcanti. He lodges at the Hôtel des Princes. Oh, I am dying! He again fainted. The abbé made him smell the contents of the file, and he again opened his eyes. His desire for revenge had not forsaken him. Oh, you will tell all I have said, will you not, reverend sir? Yes, and much more. What more will you say? 
I will say he had doubtless given you the plan of this house, in the hope the Count would kill you. I will say likewise he had apprised the Count by a note of your intention, and, the Count being absent, I read the note and sat up to await for you. And he will be guillotined, will be not, said Calorius. Promise me that, and I will die with that hope. I will say, continued the Count, that he followed and watched you the whole time, and, when he saw you leave the house, ran to the angle of the wall to conceal himself. Did you see all that? Remember my words. If you return home safely, I shall believe God has forgiven you, and I will forgive you also. And you did not warn me, cried Cadarus, raising himself on his elbows. You knew I should be killed on leaving this house, and did not warn me. No, for I saw God's justice placed in the hands of Benedetto, and should have thought it sacrilege to oppose the designs of Providence. God's justice! Speak not of it, reverend sir. If God were just, you know how many would be punished who now escape. Patience, said the abbe, in a tone which made the dying man shudder. Have patience. Cadarus looked at him with amazement. Besides, said the abbe, God is merciful to all, as he has been to you. He is first a father, then a judge. Do you then believe in God? said Cadarus. Had I been so unhappy as not to believe in him until now, said Monte Cristo, I must believe on seeing you. Cadarus raised his clinched hands towards heaven. Listen, said the abbe, extending his hand over the wounded man as if to command him to believe. This is what the God in whom, on your deathbed, you refuse to believe has done for you. He gave you health, strength, regular employment, even friends. A life, in fact, which a man might enjoy with a calm conscience. Instead of improving these gifts, rarely granted so abundantly, this has been your course. You have given yourself up to sloth and drunkenness, and in a fit of intoxication have ruined your best friend. Help, cried Cadarus. I require a surgeon, not a priest. Perhaps I am not mortally wounded. I may not die. Perhaps they can yet save my life. Your wounds are so far mortal that, without the three drops I gave you, you would now be dead. Listen, then. Ah, murmured Cadarus, what a strange priest you are. You drive the dying to despair instead of consoling them. Listen, continued the abbe, when you had betrayed your friend, God began not to strike, but to warn you. Poverty overtook you. You had already passed half your life in coveting that which you might have honorably acquired, and already you contemplated crime under the excuse of want, when God worked a miracle in your behalf, sending you by my hands a fortune, brilliant indeed for you who had never possessed any. But this unexpected, unhoped-for, unheard-of fortune sufficed you no longer when you once possessed it. You wished to double it, and how? By a murder. You succeeded, and then God snatched it from you and brought you to justice. It was not I who wished to kill the Jew, said Cadarus. It was La Carconte. Yes, said Monte Cristo, and God. I cannot say injustice, for his justice would have slain you, but God in his mercy spared your life. Pardieu, to transport me for life, how merciful! You thought it a mercy then, miserable wretch. The coward who feared death rejoiced at perpetual disgrace, for like all galley slaves you said, I may escape from prison, I cannot from the grave. And you said truly, the way was opened for you unexpectedly. An Englishman visited Toulon, who had vowed to rescue two men from infamy, and his choice fell on you and your companion. You received a second fortune. Money and tranquillity were restored to you, and you, who had been condemned to a felon's life, 
might live as other men. Then, wretched creature, then you tempted God a third time. I have not enough, you said, when you had more than you before possessed, and you committed a third crime, without reason, without excuse. God is wearied. He has punished you. Cadarus was fast sinking. Give me a drink, said he. I thirst. I burn. Monte Cristo gave him a glass of water. And yet that villain Benedetto will escape. No one, I tell you, will escape. Benedetto will be punished. Then you too will be punished, for you did not do your duty as a priest. You should have prevented Benedetto from killing me. I, said the Count with a smile which petrified the dying man, when you had just broken your knife against the coat of mail which protected my breast, yet perhaps if I had found you humble and penitent, I might have prevented Benedetto from killing you. But I found you proud and bloodthirsty, and I left you in the hands of God. I do not believe there is a God, howled Cadarus. You do not believe it. You lie. You lie. Silence, said the abbe. You will force the last drop of blood from your veins. What, you do not believe in God when he is striking you dead? You will not believe in him who requires but a prayer, a word, a tear, and he will forgive. God, who might have directed the assassin's dagger so as to end your career in a moment, has given you this quarter of an hour for repentance. Reflect then, wretched man, and repent. No, said Cadarus, no, I will not repent. There is no God, there is no providence. All comes by chance. There is a providence, there is a God, said Monte Cristo of whom you are a striking proof, as you lie in utter despair, denying him, while I stand before you, rich, happy, safe, and entreating that God in whom you endeavour not to believe, while in your heart you still believe in him. But who are you then? asked Cadarus, fixing his dying eyes on the Count. Look well at me, said Monte Cristo, putting the light near his face. Well, the Abbé, the Abbé Busoni. Monte Cristo took off the wig which disfigured him, and let fall his black hair which added so much to the beauty of his pallid features. Oh, said Cadarus, thunderstruck. But for that black hair, I should say you were the Englishman, Lord Wilmore. I am neither the Abbé Busoni nor Lord Wilmore, said Monte Cristo. Think again. Do you not recollect me? There was a magic effect in the Count's words, which once more revived the exhausted powers of the miserable man. Yes, indeed, said he. I think I have seen you and known you formerly. Yes, Cadarus, you have seen me. You knew me once. Who? Then are you, and why, if you knew me, do you let me die? Because nothing can save you. Your wounds are mortal. Had it been possible to save you, I should have considered it another proof of God's mercy, and I would again have endeavoured to restore you. I swear by my father's tomb. By your father's tomb, said Calarus, supported by a supernatural power, and half raising himself to see more distinctly the man who had just taken the oath which all men hold sacred. Who then are you? The Count had watched the approach of death. He knew this was the last struggle. He approached the dying man and leaning over him with a calm and melancholy look, he whispered, I am, I am, and his almost closed lips uttered a name so low that the Count himself appeared afraid to hear it. Cadarus, who had raised himself on his knees and stretched out his arm, tried to draw back, then clasping his hands and raising them with a desperate effort. Oh, my God! My God! 
said he, Pardon me for having denied thee. Thou dost exist. Thou art indeed man's father in heaven, and his judge on earth. My God, my Lord, I have long despised thee. Pardon me, my God, receive me, O oh my Lord. Caderus sighed deeply and fell back with a groan. The blood no longer flowed from his wounds. He was dead. One, said the Count mysteriously, his eyes fixed on the corpse, disfigured by so awful a death. Ten minutes afterwards, the surgeon and the procureur arrived, the one accompanied by the porter, the other by Ali, and were received by the Abbe Busoni, who was praying by the side of the corpse. End of chapter 83「Chapter 84 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 84 Beauchamp The daring attempt to rob the Count was the topic of conversation throughout Paris for the next fortnight. The dying man had signed a deposition declaring Benedetto to be the assassin. The police, had orders to make the strictest search for the murderer. Caderousse's knife, dark lantern, bunch of keys and clothing, excepting the waistcoat, which could not be found, were deposited at the registry. The corpse was conveyed to the morgue. The Count told everyone that this adventure had happened during his absence at Auteuil, and that he only knew what was related by the Abbe Boussoni, who that evening, by mere chance, had requested to pass the night in his house to examine some valuable books in his library. Bertuccio alone turned pale whenever Benedetto's name was mentioned in his presence, but there was no reason why anyone should notice his doing so. Villefort, being called on to prove the crime, was preparing his brief with the same ardour that he was accustomed to exercise when required to speak in criminal cases. But three weeks had already passed, and the most diligent search had been unsuccessful. The attempted robbery and the murder of the robber by his comrade were almost forgotten in anticipation of the approaching marriage of Mademoiselle Danglars to the Count Andrea Cavalcanti. It was expected that this wedding would shortly take place, as the young man was received at the banker's as the betrothed. Letters had been dispatched to Monsieur Cavalcanti as the Count's father, who highly approved of the union, regretted his inability to leave Parma at that time, and promised a wedding gift of a hundred and fifty thousand livres. It was agreed that the three millions should be entrusted to Donglard to invest. Some persons had warned the young man of the circumstances of his future father-in-law, who had of late sustained repeated losses. But with sublime disinterestedness and confidence the young man refused to listen or to express a single doubt to the baron. The baron adored Count Andrea Cavalcanti. Not so Mademoiselle Eugénie Donglard. With an instinctive hatred of matrimony, she suffered Andrea's attentions in order to get rid of Morcerf. But when Andrea urged his suit, she betrayed an entire dislike to him. The baron might possibly have perceived it, but attributing it to a caprice feigned ignorance. The delay demanded by Beauchamp had nearly expired. Morcerf appreciated the advice of Monte Cristo to let things die away of their own accord. No one had taken up the remark about the general, and no one had recognized in the officer who betrayed the castle of Giannina the noble count in the House of Peers. Albert, however, felt no less insulted. The few lines which had irritated him were certainly intended as an insult. Besides, the manner in which Beauchamp had closed the conference left a bitter recollection in his heart. He cherished the thought of the duel, hoping to conceal its true cause even from his seconds. Beauchamp had not been seen since the day he visited Albert, and those of whom the latter inquired always told him he was out on a journey which would detain him some days. Where he was, no one knew. One morning, Albert was awakened by his valet de chambre, who announced Beauchamp. Albert rubbed his eyes, 
ordered his servant to introduce him into the small smoking room on the ground floor, dressed himself quickly, and went down. He found Beauchamp pacing the room. On perceiving him, Beauchamp stopped. "'Your arrival here, without waiting my visit at your house today, looks very well, sir,' said Albert. "'Tell me, may I shake hands with you?' saying, Beauchamp, acknowledge you have injured me and retain my friendship, or must I simply propose to you a choice of arms? Albert, said Beauchamp, with a look of sorrow which stupefied the young man, let us first sit down and talk. Rather, sir, before we sit down I must demand your answer. Albert, said the journalist, these are questions which is difficult to, to answer. I will facilitate it by repeating the question. Will you or will you not retract? Morcerf, it is not enough to answer yes or no to questions which concern the honour, the social interest and the life of such a man as Lieutenant General the Count of Morcerf, peer of France. What must then be done? What I have done, Albert. I reason thus. Money, time and fatigue are nothing compared with the reputation and interests of a whole family. Probabilities will not suffice. Only facts will justify a deadly combat with a friend. If I strike with the sword, or discharge the contents of a pistol at man with whom for three years I have been on terms of intimacy, I must at least know why I do so. I must meet him with a heart at ease, and that quiet conscience which a man needs when his own arm must save his life. Well, said Morcerf impatiently. What does all this mean? It means that I have just returned from Yanina. From Yanina? Yes. Impossible. Here is my passport. Examine the visa. Geneva, Milan, Venice, Trieste, Delvino, Yanina. Will you believe the government of a republic, a kingdom, and an empire? Albert cast his eyes on the passport then raised them in astonishment to Beauchamp. "'You have been to Yanina, said he. "'Albert, had you been a stranger, a foreigner, a simple lord, like that Englishman who came to demand satisfaction three or four months since, and whom I killed to get rid of, I should not have taken this trouble. But I thought this mark of consideration due to you. I took a week to go, another to return, Four days of quarantine and forty-eight hours to stay there. That makes three weeks. I returned last night, and here I am. What circumlocution? How long you are before you tell me what I most wish to know? Because in truth, Albert... You hesitate? Yes, I fear. You fear to acknowledge that your correspondent has deceived you? Oh, no. Self-love, Beauchamp, acknowledge it. Beauchamp, your courage cannot be doubted. Not so, murmured the journalist. On the contrary. Albert turned frightfully pale. He endeavoured to speak, but the words died on his lips. My friend, said Beauchamp, in the most affectionate tone, I should gladly make an apology, but, alas! But what? The paragraph was correct, my friend. What? That French officer? Yes. Fernand? Yes. The traitor who surrendered the castle of the man in whose service he was... Pardon me, my friend. That man was your father. Albert advanced furiously towards Beauchamp, but the latter restrained him more by a mild look than by his extended hand. My friend, said he, here is a proof of it. Albert opened the paper. It was an attestation of four notable inhabitants of Yanina, proving that Colonel Fernand Mondego, in the service of Ali Tepelini, had surrendered the castle for two million crowns. The signatures were perfectly legal. Albert tottered and fell overpowered in a chair. It could no longer be doubted. The family name was fully given. After a moment's mournful silence, his heart overflowed, and he gave way to a flood of tears. Beauchamp, 
who had watched with sincere pity the young man's paroxysm of grief, approached him. "'Now, Albert,' said he, "'you understand me, do you not? I wish to see all and to judge of everything for myself, hoping the explanation would be in your father's favour, and that I might do him justice. But, on the contrary, the particulars which are given prove that Fernand Mondego, raised by Ali Pasha to the rank of Governor-General, is no other than Count Fernand of Montserrat. Then, recollecting the honour you had done me and admitting me to your friendship, I hasten to you. Albert, still extended on the chair, covered his face with both hands, as if to prevent the light from reaching him. I hasten to you, continued Beauchamp, to tell you, Albert, that in his changing age the faults of a father cannot revert upon his children. Few have passed through this revolutionary period, in the midst of which we were born, without some stain of infamy or blood to soil the uniform of the soldier or the gown of the magistrate. Now I have these proofs, Albert, and I am in your confidence. No human power can force me to a duel which your own conscience would reproach you with as criminal. But I come to offer you what you can no longer demand of me. Do you wish these proofs, these attestations, which I alone possess, to be destroyed? Do you wish this frightful secret to remain with us? Confide it to me. It shall never escape my lips. Say, Albert, my friend, do you wish it? Albert threw himself on Beauchamp's neck. Ah, oh, noble fellow, cried he. Take these, said Beauchamp, presenting the papers to Albert. Albert seized them with a convulsive hand, tore them in pieces, and trembling lest the least vestige should escape and one day appear to confront him, he approached the wax light, always kept burning for cigars, and burned every fragment. Dear, excellent friend, murmured Albert, still burning the papers. Let all be forgotten as a sorrowful dream, said Beauchamp. Let it vanish as the last sparks from the blackened paper, and disappear as the smoke from those silent ashes. Yes, yes, said Albert, and may there remain only the eternal friendship which I promised to my deliverer, which shall be transmitted to our children's children, and shall always remind me that I owe my life and the honour of my name to you. For had this been known, O oh, Beauchamp, I should have destroyed myself, or, no, my poor mother, I could not have killed her by the same blow, I should have fled from my country. Dear Albert, said Beauchamp, but this sudden and factitious joy soon forsook the young man and was succeeded by a still greater grief. Well, said Beauchamp, what still oppresses you, my friend? I am broken-hearted, said Albert. Listen, Beauchamp, I cannot thus, in a moment, relinquish the respect, the confidence and the pride with which a father's untarnished name inspires a son. Oh, Beauchamp, Beauchamp, how shall I now approach mine? Shall I draw back my forehead from his embrace, or withhold my hand from his? I am the most wretched of men. Oh, my mother, my poor mother, said Albert gazing through his tears at his mother's portrait. If you know this, how much you must suffer. Come, said Beauchamp, taking both his hands. Take courage, my friend. But how came that first note to be inserted in your journal? Some unknown enemy, an invisible foe, has done this. The more must you fortify yourself, Albert. Let no trace of emotion be visible on your countenance. Bear your grief, as the cloud bears within it ruin and death, a fatal secret, known only when the storm bursts. Go, my friend, reserve your strength for the moment when the crash shall come. You think, then, all is not over yet? said Albert, horror-stricken. I think nothing, my friend, but all things are possible. By the way... What? said Albert, seeing that Beauchamp hesitated. Are you going to marry Mademoiselle Donglard? Why do you ask me now? Because the rupture of fulfilment 
of this engagement is connected with the person of whom we are speaking. How? said Albert, whose brow reddened. You think, Monsieur Danglars? I ask you only how your engagement stands. Pray put no construction on my words I do not mean they should convey, and give them no undue weight. No, said Albert. The engagement is broken off. Well, said Beauchamp, then seeing the young man was about to relapse into melancholy. Let us go, Albert, said he. A ride in the wood in the Phaeton or on horseback will refresh you. We will then return to breakfast, and you shall attend to your affairs, and I to mine. Willingly, said Albert. But let us walk. I think a little exertion would do me good. The two friends walked out on the fortress. When arrived at the Madeleine, Since we are out, said Beauchamp, let us call on Monsieur de Monte Cristo. He is admirably adapted to revive one's spirits, because he never interrogates, and in my opinion, those who ask no questions are the best comforters. Gladly, said Albert. I love him. Let us call. End of chapter 84「Chapter 85 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 85 The Journey Monte Cristo uttered a joyful exclamation on seeing the young men together. Aha, said he, I hope all is over, explained and settled. Yes, said Beauchamp, the absurd reports have died away, and should they be renewed, I would be the first to oppose them, so let us speak no more of it. Albert will tell you, replied the Count, that I gave him the same advice. Look, added he, I am finishing the most execrable morning's work. What is it? said Albert, arranging your papers, apparently. My papers, thank God, no, my papers are in capital order, because I have none, but Monsieur Cavalcanti's. Monsieur Calvicantis? asked Beauchamp. Yes. Do you not know that this is a young man whom the Count is introducing? said Morcerf. Let us not misunderstand each other, replied Monte Cristo. I introduce no one, and certainly not Monsieur Cavalcanti. And who, said Albert with a forced smile, is to marry Mademoiselle Danglars instead of me, which grieves me cruelly. What? Cavalcanti is going to marry Mademoiselle Danglars? asked Beauchamp. Certainly. Do you come from the end of the world? said Monte Cristo. You, a journalist, the husband of renown, it is the talk of all Paris. And you, Count, have made this match? asked Beauchamp. I? Silence, purveyor of gossip, do not spread that report. I make a match? No, you do not know me. I have done all in my power to oppose it. Ah, I understand, said Beauchamp, on our friend Albert's account. On my account? said the young man. Oh, no, indeed. The Count will do me the justice to assert that I have, on the contrary, always entreated him to break off my engagement, and happily it is ended. The Count pretends I have not him to thank. So be it. I will erect an alter Deo Ignoto. Listen, said Monte Cristo, I have had little to do with it, for I am at variance both with the father-in-law and the young man. There is only Mademoiselle Eugenie, who appears but little charmed with the thoughts of matrimony, and who, seeing how little I was disposed to persuade her to renounce her dear liberty, retains any affection for me. And do you say this wedding is at hand? Oh, yes, in spite of all I could say. I do not know the young man. He is said to be of good family and rich, but I never trust too vague assertions. I have warned Monsieur Danglars of it till I am tired, but he is fascinated with his Lucanese. I have even informed him of a circumstance I consider very serious. The young man was either charmed by his nurse, stolen by gypsies, or lost by his tutor, I scarcely know which. 
but I do know his father lost sight of him for more than ten years. What he did during those ten years, God only knows. Well, all that was useless. They have commissioned me to write to the Major to demand papers, and here they are. I send them, but like pilot, washing my hands. And what does Mademoiselle d'Armilly say to you for robbing her of her pupil? Oh, well, I don't know, but I understand that she is going to Italy. Madame Donglar asked me for letters of recommendation for the impresari. I gave her a few lines for the director of the Valley Theatre, who is under some obligation to me. But what is the matter, Albert? You look dull. Are you, after all, unconsciously in love with Mademoiselle Eugénie? I am not aware of it, said Albert, smiling sorrowfully. Beauchamp turned to look at some paintings. But, continued Monte Cristo, you are not in your usual spirits. I have a dreadful headache, said Albert. Well, my dear Viscount, said Monte Cristo, I have an infallible remedy to propose to you. What is that? asked the young man. A change. Indeed, said Albert. Yes, and as I am just now excessively annoyed, I shall go from home. Shall we go together? You annoyed, Count? said Beauchamp. And by what? Ah, you think very lightly of it. I should like to see you with a brief preparing in your house. What brief? The one Monsieur de Villefort is preparing against my amiable assassin. Some brigand escaped from the gallows, apparently. True, said Beauchamp. I saw it in the paper. Who is this Cadarousse? Some provincial, it appears, Monsieur de Villefort heard of him at Marseille, and Monsieur Danglars recollects having seen him. Consequently, the procureur is very active in the affair, and the prefect of police very much interested, and thanks to that interest, for which I am very grateful, they send me all the robbers of Paris and the neighbourhood, under pretence of their being Cadorus's murderers, so that in three months, if this continues, every robber and assassin in France will have the plan of my house at his finger's end. I am resolved to desert them, and go to some remote corner of the earth, and shall be happy if you will accompany me, Viscount. Willingly. Then it is settled. Yes, but where? I have told you, where the air is pure, where every sound soothes, where one is sure to be humbled, however proud may be his nature. I love that humiliation, I who am master of the universe, as was Augustus. But where are you really going? To sea, Viscount. You know I am a sailor. I was rocked when an infant in the arms of old ocean and on the bosom of the beautiful Amphrodite. I have sported with the green mantle of the one and the Asia robe of the other. I love the sea as a mistress, and pine if I do not often see her. Let us go, Count. To see? Yes. You accept my proposal? I do. Well, Viscount, there will be in my courtyard this evening a good travelling britska with four post horses, in which one may rest, as in a bed, Monsieur Beauchamp, it holds four very well. Will you accompany us? Thank you. I have just returned from the sea. What? You have been to sea? Yes, I have just made a little excursion to the Borromean Islands. What of that? Come with us, said Albert. No, dear Morcerf, you know I only refuse when the thing is impossible. Besides, it is important, added he in a low tone, that I should remain in Paris just now to watch the paper. Ah, you are good and excellent friend, said Albert. Yes, you are right. Watch, watch, Beauchamp, and try to discover the enemy who made this disclosure. Albert and Beauchamp parted, the last pressure of their hands expressing what their tongues could not before a stranger. Beauchamp is a worthy fellow, said Monte Cristo, when the journalist was gone. Is he not, Albert? 
Yes, and a sincere friend. I love him devotedly. But now we are alone, although it is immaterial to me. Where are we going? Into Normandy, if you like. Delightful. Shall we be quite retired? Have no society, no neighbours? Our companions will be riding horses, dogs to hunt with, and a fishing boat. Exactly what I wish for. I will apprise my mother of my intention, and return to you. But shall you be allowed to go into Normandy? I may go where I please. Yes, I am aware you may go alone, since I once met you in Italy, but to accompany the mysterious Monte Cristo. You forget, Count, that I have often told you of the deep interest my mother takes in you. Woman is fickle, said Francis first. Woman is like a wave of the sea, said Shakespeare. Both the great king and the great poet ought to have known woman's nature well. Woman's, yes. My mother is not a woman, but a woman. As I am only a humble foreigner, you must pardon me if I do not understand all the subtle refinements of your language. What I mean to say is that my mother is not quick to give her confidence, but when she does, she never changes. Ah, yes, indeed, said Monte Cristo with a sigh. And do you think she is in the least interested in me? I repeat it, you must really be a very strange and superior man, for my mother is so absorbed by the interest you have excited that when I am with her she speaks of no one else. And does she try to make you dislike me? On the contrary, she often says, Morcerf, I believe the Count has a noble nature. Try to gain his esteem. Indeed, said Monte Cristo, sighing. You see then, said Albert, that instead of opposing, she will encourage me. Adieu then, until five o'clock. Be punctual and we shall arrive at twelve or one. At Treport? Yes, or in the neighbourhood. But can we travel forty-eight leagues in eight hours? Easily, said Monte Cristo. You are certain a prodigy. You will soon not only surpass the railway, which would not be very difficult in France, but even the telegraph. But, Viscount, since we cannot perform the journey in less than seven or eight hours, do not keep me waiting. Do not fear. I have little to prepare. Monte Cristo smiled as he nodded to Albert, then remained a moment absorbed in deep meditation, but passing his hand across his forehead as if to dispel his reverie, he rang the bell twice, and Bertuccio entered. Bertuccio, said he, I intend going this evening to Normandy, instead of tomorrow or the next day. You will have sufficient time before five o'clock. Dispatch a messenger to apprise the grooms at the first station. Monsieur de Morcerf will accompany me. Bertuccio obeyed and dispatched a courier to Pontoise to say the travelling carriage would arrive at six o'clock. From Pontoise, another express was sent to the next stage, and in six hours all the horses stationed on the road were ready. Before his departure, the Count went to Hades' apartments, told her his intention, and resigned everything to her care. Albert was punctual. The journey soon became interesting from its rapidity, of which Morcerf had formed no previous idea. Truly, said Monte Cristo, with your post horses going at the rate of two leagues an hour, and that absurd law that one traveller shall not pass another without permission, so that an invalid or ill-tempered traveller may detain those who are well and active, it is impossible to move. I escape this annoyance by travelling with my own postilion and horses, do I not, Ali? The Count put his head out of the window and whistled, and the horses appeared to fly. The carriage rolled with a thundering noise over the pavement, and every one turned to notice the dazzling meteor. Ali, smiling, repeated the sound, grasped the reins with a firm hand, and spurred his horses, whose beautiful manes floated in the breeze. This child of the desert was in his element, and with his black face and sparkling eyes appeared in the cloud of dust he raised, like the genius of the simoom 
and the god of the hurricane. I never knew till now the delight of speed, said Morcerf, and the last cloud disappeared from his brow. But where the devil do you get such horses? Are they made to order? Precisely, said the Count. Six years since I bought a horse in Hungary remarkable for its swiftness. The thirty-two that we shall use tonight are its progeny. They are all entirely black, with the exception of a star upon the forehead. That is perfectly admirable. But what do you do, Count, with all these horses? You see, I travel with them. But you are not always travelling. When I no longer require them, Bertuccio will sell them, and he expects to realise thirty or forty thousand francs by the sale. But no monarch in Europe will be wealthy enough to purchase them. Then he will sell them to some eastern vizier, who will empty his coffers to purchase them, and refill them by applying the bastinado to his subjects. Count, may I suggest one idea to you? Certainly. It is that... Next to you, Bertuccio must be the richest gentleman in Europe. You are mistaken, Viscount. I believe he has not a franc in his possession. Then he must be a wonder, my dear Count. If you tell me many more marvellous things, I warn you I shall not believe them. I countenance nothing that is marvellous, Monsieur Albert. Tell me, why does a steward rob his master? Because, I suppose... It is his nature to do so, for the love of robbing. You are mistaken. It is because he has a wife and family, and ambitious desires for himself and them. Also because he is not sure of always retaining his situation, and wishes to provide for the future. Now Monsieur Bertuccio is alone in the world. He uses my property without accounting for the use he makes of it. He is sure never to leave my service. Why? Because I should never get a better. Probabilities are deceptive. But I deal in certainties. He is the best servant over whom one has the power of life and death. Do you possess that right over Betuccio? Yes. There are words which close a conversation with an iron door. Such was the Count's yes. The whole journey was performed with equal rapidity. The thirty-two horses, dispersed over seven stages, brought them to their destination in eight hours. At midnight they arrived at the gate of a beautiful park. The porter was in attendance. He had been apprised by the groom of the last stage of the Count's approach. At half-past two in the morning, Morcerf was conducted to his apartments, where a bath and supper were prepared. The servant, who had travelled at the back of the carriage, waited on him. Baptistin, who rode in front, attended the Count. Albert bathed, took his supper and went to bed. All night he was lulled by the melancholy noise of the surf. On rising, he went to his window, which opened on a terrace, having the sea in front, and at the back a pretty park, bounded by a small forest. In a creek lay a little sloop, with a narrow keel and high masts, bearing on its flag the Monte Cristo arms, which were a mountain on a sea Asia, with a cross gules on the shield. Around the schooner lay a number of small fishing boats belonging to the fishermen of the neighbouring village, like humble subjects awaiting orders from their queen. There, as in every spot where Monte Cristo stopped, if but for two days, luxury abounded, and life went on with the utmost ease, Albert found in his anteroom two guns, with all the accoutrements for hunting, a lofty room on the ground floor containing all the ingenious instruments the English, eminent in piscatory pursuits, since they are patient and sluggish, have invented for fishing. The day passed in pursuing those exercises in which Monte Cristo excelled. They killed a dozen pheasants in the park, as many trout in the stream, dined in a summer-house overlooking the ocean, and took tea in the library. Towards the evening of the third day, Albert, completely exhausted with the exercise which invigorated Monte Cristo, was sleeping in an armchair near the window, while the Count was designing with his architect 
the plan of a conservatory in his house when the sound of a horse at full speed on the high road made Albert look up. He was disagreeably surprised to see his own valet de chambre, whom he had not brought, that he might not inconvenience Monte Cristo. Florentin here, cried he, starting up. Is my mother ill? And he hastened to the door. Monte Cristo watched and saw him approach the valet, who drew a small sealed parcel from his pocket, containing a newspaper and a letter. From whom is this? said he eagerly. From Monsieur Beauchamp, replied Florentin. Did he send you? Yes, sir. He sent for me to his house, gave me money for my journey, procured a horse, and made me promise not to stop till I had reached you. I have come in fifteen hours. Albert opened the letter with fear, uttered a shriek on reading the first line, and seized the paper. His sight was dimmed, his legs sank under him, and he would have fallen had not Florentin supported him. "'Poor young man,' said Monte Cristo in a low voice. "'It is then true that the sin of the father shall fall on the children to the third and fourth generation.' Meanwhile Albert had revived, and continuing to read, he threw back his head, saying, "'Florentin, is your horse fit to return immediately?' "'It is a poor lame post-horse.' "'In what state was the house when you left?' All was quiet, but on returning from Monsieur Beauchamp, I found Madame in tears. She had sent for me to know when you would return. I told her my orders from Monsieur Beauchamp. She first extended her arms to prevent me, but after a moment's reflection. Yes, go, Florentine, said she, and may he come quickly. Yes, my mother, said Albert, I will return, and woe to the infamous wretch. But first of all I must get there. He went back to the room where he had left Monte Cristo. Five minutes had sufficed to make a complete transformation in his appearance. His voice had become rough and hoarse. His face was furrowed with wrinkles. His eyes burned under the blue-veined lids, and he tottered like a drunken man. Count, said he, I thank you for your hospitality, which I would gladly have enjoyed longer. But I must return to Paris. What has happened? A great misfortune, more important to me than life. Don't question me, I beg of you, but lend me a horse. My stables are at your command, Viscount, but you will kill yourself by riding on horseback. Take a post-chaise or a carriage. No, it would delay me, and I need the fatigue you warn me of. It will do me good. Albert reeled as if he'd been shot and fell on a chair near the door. Monte Cristo did not see this second manifestation of physical exhaustion. He was at the window calling, Ali, a horse for Monsieur de Morcerf. Quick, he is in a hurry. These words restored Albert. He darted from the room, followed by the Count. Thank you, cried he, throwing himself on his horse. Return as soon as you can, Florentin. Must I use any password to procure a horse? Only dismount. Another will be immediately saddled. Albert hesitated a moment. You may think my departure strange and foolish, said the young man. You do not know how a paragraph in a newspaper may exasperate one. Read that, said he, when I am gone, that you may not be witness of my anger. While the Count picked up the paper, he put spurs to his horse, which leapt in astonishment at such an unusual stimulus, and shot away with the rapidity of an arrow. The Count watched him with a feeling of compassion, and when he had completely disappeared, read as follows. The French officer in the service of Ali Pasha of Yanina alluded to three weeks since in the impartial, who not only surrendered the castle of Yanina, but sold his benefactor to the Turks, styled himself truly at that time Fernand, as our esteemed contemporary states. But he has since added to his Christian name a title of nobility and a family name. He now calls himself the Count of Morcerf and ranks among the peers. Thus the terrible secret, which Beauchamp had so generously destroyed, appeared again like an armed phantom, and another paper, 
deriving its information from some malicious source, had published two days after Albert's departure for Normandy, the few lines which had rendered the unfortunate young man almost crazy. End of chapter 85Chapter 86 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 86 The Trial. At eight o'clock in the morning, Albert had arrived at Beauchamp's door. The valet de chambre had received orders to usher him in at once. Beauchamp was in his bath. Here I am, said Albert. Well, my poor friend, replied Beauchamp. I expected you. I need not say, I think you are too faithful and too kind to have spoken of that painful circumstance. Your having sent for me is another proof of your affection. So, without losing time, tell me, have you the slightest idea whence this terrible blow proceeds? I think I have some clue. But first tell me all the particulars of this shameful plot." Beauchamp proceeded to relate to the young man, who was overwhelmed with shame and grief, the following facts. Two days previously, the article had appeared in another paper besides the impartial, and what was more serious, one that was well known as a government paper. Beauchamp was breakfasting when he read the paragraph. He sent immediately for a cabriolet, and hastened to the publisher's office. Although professing diametrically opposite principles from those of the editor of the other paper, Beauchamp, as it sometimes, we may say often, happens, was his intimate friend. The editor was reading, with apparent delight, a leading article in the same paper on beet sugar, probably a composition of his own. "'Ah, pardieu,' said Beauchamp, "'with the paper in your hand, my friend, I need not tell you the cause of my visit.' "'Are you interested in the sugar question?' asked the editor of the ministerial paper. "'No,' replied Beauchamp. "'I have not considered the question. A totally different subject interests me.' "'What is it?' "'The article relative to Morcerf. "'Indeed. Is it not a curious affair?' "'So curious that I think you are running a great risk of a prosecution for defamation of character.' "'Not at all.' We have received with the information all the requisite proofs, and we are quite sure Monsieur de Morcerf will not raise his voice against us. Besides, it is rendering a service to one's country to denounce these wretched criminals who are unworthy of the honour bestowed on them. Beauchamp was thunderstruck. Who then has so correctly informed you? asked he. For my paper, which gave the first information on the subject, has been obliged to stop for want of proof, and yet we are more interested than you in exposing Monsieur de Morcerf, as he is a peer of France, and we are of the opposition. Oh, that is very simple. We have not sought to scandalize. This news was brought to us. A man arrived yesterday from Yanina, bringing a formidable array of documents, and when we hesitated to publish the accusatory article, he told us it should be inserted in some other paper. Beauchamp understood that nothing remained but to submit, and left the office to dispatch a courier to Morcerf. But he had been unable to send to Albert the following particulars, as the events had transpired after the messenger's departure, namely, that the same day a great agitation was manifest in the House of Peers among the usually calm members of that dignified assembly. Everyone had arrived almost before the usual hour, and was conversing on the melancholy event which was to attract the attention of the public towards one of their most illustrious colleagues. Some were perusing the article, others making comments and recalling circumstances which substantiated the charges still more. The Count of Morcerf was no favourite with his colleagues. Like all upstarts, he had had recourse to a great deal of haughtiness to maintain his position. The true nobility laughed at him, the talented repelled him, and the honourable instinctively despised him. He was, in fact, in the unhappy position of the victim marked for sacrifice. The finger of God once pointed at him, everyone was prepared to raise the hue and cry. 
the Count of Morcerf alone was ignorant of the news. He did not take in the paper containing the defamatory article, and had passed the morning in writing letters and in trying a horse. He arrived at his usual hour, with a proud look and insolent demeanour. He alighted, passed through the corridors, and entered the house without observing the hesitation of the doorkeepers or the coolness of his colleagues. Business had already been going on for half an hour when he entered. Everyone held the accusing paper. But as usual, no one liked to take upon himself the responsibility of the attack. At length, an honourable peer, Morcerf's acknowledged enemy, ascended the tribune with that solemnity which announced that the expected moment had arrived. There was an impressive silence. Morcerf alone knew not why such profound attention was given to an orator who was not always listened to with so much complacency. The Count did not notice the introduction, in which the speaker announced that his communication would be of that vital importance that it demanded the undivided attention of the house. But at the mention of Yanina and Colonel Fernand, he turned so frightfully pale that every member shuddered and fixed his eyes upon him. Moral wounds have this peculiarity. They may be hidden, but they never close. Always painful, always ready to bleed when touched, they remain fresh and open in the heart. The article having been read during the painful hush that followed, a universal shudder pervaded the assembly, and immediately the closest attention was given to the orator as he resumed his remarks. He stated his scruples and the difficulties of the case, it was the honour of Monsieur de Morcerf and that of the whole house he proposed to defend by provoking a debate on personal questions, which are always such painful themes of discussion. He concluded by calling for an investigation which might dispose of the calumnious report before it had time to spread and restore Monsieur de Morcerf to the position he had long held in public opinion. Morcerf was so completely overwhelmed by this great and unexpected calamity that he could scarcely stammer a few words as he looked around on the assembly. This timidity which might proceed from the astonishment of innocence, as well as the shame of guilt, conciliated some in his favour, for men who are truly generous are always ready to compassionate when the misfortune of their enemy surpasses the limits of their hatred. The President put it to the vote, and it was decided that the investigation should take place. The Count was asked what time he required to prepare his defence. Morcerf's courage had revived when he found himself alive after this horrible blow. "'My lords,' answered he, "'it is not by time I could repel the attack made on me by enemies unknown to me, and doubtless hidden in obscurity. It is immediately, and by a thunderbolt, that I must repel the flash of lightning which for a moment startled me. Oh, that I could, instead of taking up this defence, shed my last drop of blood to prove to my noble colleagues that I am their equal in worth. These words made a favourable impression on behalf of the accused. I demand then that the examination shall take place as soon as possible, and I will furnish the house with all necessary information. "'What day do you fix?' asked the President. "'Today I am at your service,' replied the Count. The President rang the bell. "'Does the House approve that the examination should take place today?' "'Yes,' was the unanimous answer. A committee of twelve members was chosen to examine the proofs brought forward by Morcerf. The investigation would begin at eight o'clock that evening in the committee room, and, if postponement were necessary, the proceedings would be resumed each evening at the same hour. Morcerf asked leave to retire. He had to collect the documents he had long been preparing against this storm, which his sagacity had foreseen. Albert listened, trembling now with hope, then with anger, and then again with shame, for from Beauchamp's confidence he knew his father was guilty, and he asked himself how, since he was guilty, he could prove his innocence. Beauchamp hesitated to continue his narrative. "'What next?' asked Albert. "'What next, my friend? You impose a painful task on me. Must you know all?' "'Absolutely, 
and rather from your lips than another's. Muster up all your courage, then, for never have you required it more. Albert passed his hand over his forehead, as if to try his strength as a man who is preparing to defend his life proves his shield and bends his sword. He thought himself strong enough, for he mistook fever for energy. Go on, said he. The evening arrived. All Paris was in expectation. Many said your father had only to show himself to crush the charge against him. Many others said he would not appear, while some asserted that they had seen him start for Brussels, and others went to the police office to inquire if he had taken out a passport. I used all my influence with one of the committee, a young peer of my acquaintance, to get admission to one of the galleries. He called for me at seven o'clock, and before anyone had arrived, asked one of the doorkeepers to place me in a box. I was concealed by a column, and might witness the whole of the terrible scene which was about to take place. At eight o'clock all were in their places, and Monsieur de Morcerf entered at the last stroke. He held some papers in his hand. His countenance was calm, and his step firm, and he was dressed with great care in his military uniform, which was buttoned completely up to the chin. His presence produced a good effect. The committee was made up of liberals, several of whom came forward to shake hands with him. Albert felt his heart bursting at these particulars, but gratitude mingled with his sorrow. He would gladly have embraced those who had given his father this proof of esteem at a moment when his honour was so powerfully attacked. At this moment, one of the doorkeepers brought in a letter for the président. "'You are at liberty to speak, Monsieur de Morcerf,' said the président, as he unsealed the letter, and the Count began his defence. "'I assure you, Albert, in a most eloquent and skilful manner. He produced documents proving that the vizier of Yanina had up to the last moment honoured him with his entire confidence, since he had interested him with a negotiation of life and death with the emperor. He produced a ring, his mark of authority, with which Ali Pasha generally sealed his letters, and which the latter had given him that he might, on his return at any hour of the day or night, gain access to the presence even in the harem. Unfortunately, the negotiation failed, and when he returned to defend his benefactor, he was dead. But, said the Count, so great was Ali Pasha's confidence that on his deathbed he resigned his favourite mistress and her daughter to my care. Albert started on hearing these words. The history of Hadi recurred to him, and he remembered what she had said of that message and the ring, and the manner in which she had been sold and made a slave. "'And what effect did this discourse produce?' anxiously inquired Albert. "'I acknowledge it affected me, and indeed all the committee also,' said Beauchamp. Meanwhile the President carelessly opened the letter which had been brought to him, but the first lines aroused his attention. He read them again and again and fixing his eyes on Monsieur de Morcerf. Count, said he, you have said that the vizier of Yanina confided his wife and daughter to your care. Yes, sir, replied Morcerf, but in that, like all the rest, misfortune pursued me. On my return, Vasiliki and her daughter Heidi had disappeared. Did you know them? My intimacy with the Pasha and his unlimited confidence had gained me an introduction to them, and I had seen them about twenty times. Have you any idea what became of them? Yes, sir. I heard they had fallen victims to their sorrow, and perhaps to their poverty. I was not rich. My life was in constant danger. I could not seek them, to my great regret. The President frowned imperceptibly. Gentlemen, said he, you have heard the Comte de Morcerf's defence. Can you, sir, produce any witnesses to the truth of what you have asserted? Alas, no, monsieur, replied the Count. All those surrounding the vizier, or who knew me at his court, are either dead or gone away. I know not where. I believe that I alone, of all my countrymen, survived that dreadful war. I have only the letters of Ali Tepelini, which I have placed before you. The ring a token of his goodwill, which is here, 
And lastly, the most convincing proof I can offer, after an anonymous attack, and that is the absence of any witness against my veracity and the purity of my military life. A murmur of approbation ran through the assembly, and at this moment, Albert, had nothing more transpired, your father's cause had been gained. It only remained to put it to the vote, when the President resumed, Gentlemen, and you, monsieur, you will not be displeased, I presume, to listen to one who calls himself a very important witness, and who has just presented himself. He is doubtless come to prove the perfect innocence of our colleague. Here is a letter I have just received on the subject. Shall it be read, or shall it be passed over? And shall we take no notice of this incident? Monsieur de Morcerf turned pale and clinched his hands on the papers he held. The committee decided to hear the letter. The count was thoughtful and silent. The président read, Monsieur Président, I can furnish the committee of inquiry into the conduct of the lieutenant general the Count of Morcerf in Epirus and in Macedonia with important particulars. The président paused, and the count turned pale. The president looked at his auditors. Proceed, was heard on all sides. The president resumed. I was on the spot at the death of Ali Pasha. I was present during these last moments. I know what is become of Vasiliki and Hedi. I am at the command of the committee and even claim the honor of being heard. I shall be in the lobby when this note is delivered to you. And who is this witness, or rather this enemy? asked the Count in a tone in which there was a visible alteration. We shall know, sir, replied the President. Is the committee willing to hear this witness? Yes, yes, they all said at once. The doorkeeper was called. Is there anyone in the lobby? said the President. Yes, sir. Who is it? A woman, accompanied by a servant. Everyone looked at his neighbor. Bring her in, said the president. Five minutes after the doorkeeper again appeared, all eyes were fixed on the door, and I, said Beauchamp, shared the general expectation and anxiety. Behind the doorkeeper walked a woman enveloped in a large veil, which completely concealed her. It was evident from her figure and the perfumes she had about her that she was young and fastidious in her tastes but that was all. The president requested her to throw aside her veil, and it was then seen that she was dressed in the Grecian costume and was remarkably beautiful. Ah, oh, said Albert, it was she. Who? Hedy. Who told you that? Alas, I guess it. But go on, Beauchamp. You see, I am calm and strong, and yet we must be drawing near the disclosure. Monsieur de Morcerf, continued Beauchamp, looked at this woman with a surprise and terror. Her lips were about to pass his sentence of life or death. To the committee, the adventure was so extraordinary and curious that the interest they had felt for the Count's safety became now quite a secondary matter. The President himself advanced to a place a seat for the young lady, but she declined, availing herself of it. As for the Count, he had fallen on his chair. It was evident that his legs refused to support him. Madame, said the President, you have engaged to furnish the committee with some important particulars respecting the affair at Yanina, and you have stated that you are an eyewitness of the event. I was indeed, said the stranger with a tone of sweet melancholy and with a sonorous voice peculiar to the East. But allow me to say that you must have been very young then. I was four years old. But as those events deeply concerned me, not a single detail was escaped from my memory. In what manner could these events concern you? And who are you that they should have made so deep an impression on you? On them depended my father's life, replied she. I am Hedy the daughter of Ali Tepelini, Pasha of Yanina, and of Vasiliki, his beloved wife. 
the blush of mingled pride and modesty which suddenly suffused the cheeks of the young woman, the brilliancy of her eye and her highly important communication, produced an indescribable effect on the assembly. As for the Count, he could not have been more overwhelmed if a thunderbolt had fallen at his feet and opened an immense gulf before him. Madame, replied the President, bowing with profound respect, allow me to ask one question. It shall be the last. Can you prove the authenticity of what you have now stated? I can, sir, said Edie, drawing from under her veil a satin satchel highly perfumed. For here is the register of my birth, signed by my father and his principal officers, and that of my baptism, my father having consented to my being brought up in my mother's faith. This latter has been sealed with the Grand Primate of Macedonia and Epirus. And lastly, and perhaps the most important, the record of the sale of my person and that of my mother to the Armenian merchant El Corbir by the French officer, who in his infamous bargain with the Porte had reserved as his part of the booty the wife and daughter of his benefactor, whom he sold for the sum of four hundred thousand francs. A greenish pallor spread over the Count's cheeks, and his eyes became bloodshot at these terrible imputations, which were listened to by the assembly with ominous silence. Hedy, still calm, but with a calmness more dreadful than the anger of another would have been, handed to the President the record of her sale, written in Arabic. It had been supposed some of the papers might be in the Arabian, Romaic or Turkish language, and the interpreter of the house was in attendance. One of the noble peers, who was familiar with the Arabic language, having studied it during the famous Egyptian campaign, followed with his eyes as the translator read aloud. I, El Kobir, a slave merchant and purveyor of the arm of his highness, acknowledge having received for transmission to the sublime emperor from the French lord, the Count of Monte Cristo, an emerald valued at 800,000 francs as the ransom of a young Christian slave of 11 years of age named Aidi, the acknowledged daughter of the late Lord Ali Tepellini, Pasha of Yanina and of Vasiliki, his favourite, she having been sold to me seven years previously with her mother, who had died on arriving at Constantinople by a French colonel in the service of the vizier Ali Tepellini, named Fernand Mondego. The above-mentioned purchase was made on his highness's account, whose mandate I had for the sum of 400,000 francs. Given at Constantinople by authority of his highness in the year 1247 of the Hegira, signed El Kobir. That this record should have all due authority, it shall bear the imperial seal, which the vendor is bound to have affixed to it. Near the merchant's signature, there was indeed the seal of the sublime emperor. A dreadful silence followed the reading of this document. The count could only stare, and his gaze, fixed as if unconsciously on Hedy, seemed one of fire and blood. Madame, said the president, may reference be made to the Count of Monte Cristo, who is now, I believe, in Paris. Sir, replied Hedy, the Count of Monte Cristo, my foster father, has been in Normandy the last three days. Who, then, has counseled you to take this step? one for which the court is deeply indebted to you, and which is perfectly natural, considering your birth and your misfortunes. Sir, replied Hedy, I have been led to take this step from a feeling of respect and grief. Although a Christian, may God forgive me, I have always sought to revenge my illustrious father. Since I set my foot in France, and knew the traitor lived in Paris, I have watched carefully. I live retired in the house of my noble protector, but I do it from my choice. I love retirement and silence, because I can live with my thoughts and recollections of my past days. But the Count of Monte Cristo surrounds me with every paternal care, and I am ignorant of nothing which passes in the world. 
I learn all in the silence of my apartments, for instance. I see all the newspapers, every periodical as well as every new piece of music, and by thus watching the course of the life of others, I learned what had transpired this morning in the House of Peers, and what was to take place this evening when I wrote. Then, remarked the President, the Count of Monte Cristo knows nothing of your present proceedings. He is quite unaware of them, and I have but one fear, which is that he should disapprove of what I have done. But it is a glorious day for me, continued the young girl, raising her ardent gaze to heaven, that on which I find at last an opportunity of avenging my father. The Count had not uttered one word the whole of this time. His colleagues looked at him and doubtless pitied his prospects, blighted under the perfumed breath of a woman. His misery was depicted in sinister lines on his countenance. Monsieur de Morcerf, said the President, do you recognize this lady as the daughter of Ali Tepelini, Pasha of Yanina? No, said Morcerf, attempting to rise. It is a base plot, contrived by my enemies. Heidi, whose eyes had been fixed on the door as if expecting someone, turned hastily and seeing the Count standing, shrieked. You do not know me, said she. Well, I fortunately recognize you. You are Fernand Mondego, the French officer who led the troops of my noble father. It is you who surrendered the castle of Janina. It is you who were sent by him to Constantinople to treat with the emperor for the life or death of your benefactor, brought back a false mandate granting full pardon. It is you who, with that mandate, obtained the Pasha's ring, which gave you authority of the Selim, the firekeeper. It is you who stabbed Selim. It is you who sold us, my mother and me, to the merchant El Kobir. Assassin! 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 You have still on your brow your master's blood. Look, gentlemen, all! These words had been pronounced with such enthusiasm and evident truth that every eye was fixed on the Count's forehead, and he himself passed his hand across it as if he felt Ali's blood still lingered there. "'You positively recognize Monsieur de Morcerf as the officer, Fernand Mondego?' "'Indeed I do,' cried Heidi. "'Oh, my mother, it was you who said. "'You were free, you had a beloved father, "'you were destined to be almost a queen. "'Look well at that man. "'It is he who raised your father's head on the point of a spear. "'It is he who sold us. It is he who forsook us. Look well at his right hand, on which he has a large wound. If you forgot his features, you would know him by that hand, into which fell, one by one, the gold pieces of the merchant El Kofir. I know him. Ah, let him say now, if he does not recognize me. His word fell like a dagger on Morsef, and deprived him of a portion of his energy as she uttered the last. He hid his mutilated hand hastily on his bosom and fell back on his seat, overwhelmed by wretchedness and despair. This scene completely changed the opinion of the assembly respecting the accused Count. "'Count of Morcerf,' said the President, "'do not allow yourself to be cast down. Answer. The justice of the court is supreme and impartial as that of God. It will not suffer you to be trampled on by your enemies,' without giving you an opportunity of defending yourself. Shall further inquiries be made? Shall two members of the house be sent to Yanina? Speak. Morcerf did not reply. Then all the members looked at each other with terror. They knew the Count's energetic and violent temper. It must be indeed a dreadful blow which would deprive him of courage to defend himself. They expected that his stupefied silence would be followed by a fiery outburst. Well, asked the President, what is your decision? I have no reply to make, said the Count in a low tone. Has the daughter of Ali Tepelini spoken the truth? said the President. Is she then the terrible witness to whose charge you dare not plead not guilty? Have you really committed the crimes of which you are accused? The Count looked around him with an expression which might have softened tigers, but which could not disarm his judges. Then he raised his eyes toward the ceiling, 
but withdrew them immediately, as if he feared the roof would open and reveal to his distressed view that second tribunal called Evan, and that other judge named God. Then, with a hasty movement, he tore open his coat, which seemed to stifle him, and flew from the room like a madman. His footstep was heard one moment in the corridor, then the rattling of his carriage wheels as he was driven rapidly away. Gentlemen, said the President, when silence was restored, is the Count of Morcerf convicted of felony, treason, and conduct unbecoming a member of this house? Yes, replied all the members of the Committee of Inquiry with a unanimous voice. Hedy had remained until the close of the meeting. She heard the Count's sentence pronounced without betraying an expression of joy or pity. Then drawing her veil over her face, she bowed majestically to the councillors and left with that dignified step which Virgil attributes to his goddesses. End of chapter 86Chapter 87 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 87 The Challenge. Then, continued Beauchamp, I took advantage of the silence and the darkness to leave the house without being seen. The usher who had introduced me was waiting for me at the door, and he conducted me through the corridors to a private entrance opening into the Rue de Vaugirard. I left with mingled feelings of sorrow and delight. Excuse me, Albert, sorrow on your account, and delight with that noble girl, thus pursuing paternal vengeance. Yes, Albert, from whatever source the blow may have proceeded, it may be from an enemy, but that enemy is only the agent of Providence. Albert held his head between his hands, he raised his face, red with shame and bathed in tears, and seizing Beauchamp's arm, "'My friend,' said he, "'my life is ended. I cannot calmly say with you, Providence has struck the blow, but I must discover who pursues me with this hatred, and when I have found him I shall kill him, or he will kill me. I rely on your friendship to assist me, Beauchamp, if contempt has not banished it from your heart.' Contempt, my friend? How does this misfortune affect you? No, happily that unjust prejudice is forgotten which made the son responsible for the father's actions. Review your life, Albert. Although it is only just beginning, did a lovely summer's day ever dawn with greater purity than has marked the commencement of your career? No, Albert. Take my advice. You are young and rich. Leave Paris. All is soon forgotten in this great Babylon of excitement and changing tastes. You will return after three or four years with a Russian princess for a bride, and no one will think more of what occurred yesterday than if it had happened sixteen years ago. Thank you, my dear Beauchamp. Thank you for the excellent feeling which prompts your advice. But it cannot be. I have told you my wish, or rather my determination, you understand that, interested as I am in this affair, I cannot see it in the same light as you do. What appears to you to emanate from a celestial source seems to me to proceed from one far less pure. Providence appears to me to have no share in this affair, and happily so, for instead of the invisible, impalpable agent of celestial rewards and punishments, I shall find one both palpable and visible on whom I shall revenge myself. I assure you, for all I have suffered during the last month. Now, I repeat, Beauchamp, I wish to return to human and material existence, and if you are still the friend you profess to be, help me to discover the hand that struck the blow. Be it so, said Beauchamp, if you must have me descend to earth, I submit, and if you will seek your enemy, I will assist you, and I will engage to find him, my honour being almost as deeply interested as yours. Well then, you understand, Beauchamp, that we begin our search immediately. 
Each moment's delay is an eternity for me. The calumniator is not yet punished, and he may hope that he will not be. But on my honor, if he thinks so, he deceives himself. Well, listen, Morcerf. Ah, Beauchamp, I see you know something already. You will restore me to life. I do not say there is any truth in what I am going to tell you, but it is at least a ray of light in a dark night. By following it we may discover perhaps something more certain. Tell me. Satisfy my impatience. Well, I will tell you what I did not like to mention on my return from Yanina. Say on. I went, of course, to the chief banker of the town to make inquiries. At the first word, before I had even mentioned your father's name. Ah, said he, I guess what brings you here. How and why? Because a fortnight since I was questioned on the same subject. By whom? By a Paris banker, my correspondent, whose name is Danglars. He, cried Albert, yes, it is indeed he who has no long pursued my father with jealous hatred. He, the man who would be popular, cannot forgive the Count of Morcerf for being created a peer, and this marriage broken off without a reason being assigned. Yes, it is all from the same cause. Make inquiries, Albert, but do not be angry without reason. Make inquiries, and if it be true. Oh, yes, if it be true, cried the young man, he shall pay me all I have suffered. Beware, Morcerf, he is already an old man. I will respect his age, as he has respected the honour of my family. If my father had offended him, why did he not attack him personally? Oh, no, he was afraid to encounter him face to face. I do not condemn you, Albert. I only restrain you. Act prudently. Oh, do not fear. Besides, you will accompany me. Beauchamp, solemn transactions should be sanctioned by a witness. Before this day closes, if Monsieur Danglars is guilty, he shall cease to live, or I shall die. Pardieu, Beauchamp, Mine shall be a splendid funeral. When such resolutions are made, Albert, they should be promptly executed. Do you wish to go to Monsieur Danglars? Let us go immediately. They sent for a cabriolet. On entering the banker's mansion, they perceived the phaeton and servant of Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti. Ah, parbleu, that's good, said Albert with a gloomy tone. If Monsieur Danglars will not fight with me, I will kill his son-in-law. Cavalcanti will certainly fight. The servant announced the young man, but the banker, recollecting what had transpired the day before, did not wish him admitted. It was, however, too late. Albert had followed the footman, and, hearing the order given, forced the door open, and, followed by Beauchamp, found himself in the banker's study. Sir, cried the latter, Am I no longer at liberty to receive whom I choose in my house? You appear to forget yourself sadly. No, sir, said Albert coldly. There are circumstances in which one cannot, except through cowardice. I offer you that refuge. Refuse to admit certain persons at least. What is your errand then with me, sir? I mean, said Albert, drawing near and without apparently noticing Cavalcanti, who stood with his back towards the fireplace. I mean to propose a meeting in some retired corner where no one will interrupt us for ten minutes. That will be sufficient. Where two men, having met, one of them will remain on the ground. Donglar turned pale. Cavalcanti moved a step forward, and Albert turned towards him. And you too, said he, Come if you like, monsieur. You have a claim, being almost one of the family, and I will give as many rendezvous of that kind as I can find persons willing to accept them. Cavalcanti looked at Donglars with a stupefied air, and the latter, making an effort, arose and stepped between the two young men. Albert's attack on Andrea had placed him on a different footing, and he hoped this visit had another cause than that he had first supposed. 
"'Indeed, sir,' said he to Albert, "'if you are come to quarrel with this gentleman "'because I have preferred him to you, "'I shall resign the case to the king's attorney.' "'You mistake, sir,' said Morcerf with a gloomy smile. "'I am not referring in the least to matrimony, "'and I only address myself to Monsieur Cavalcanti "'because he appeared disposed to interfere between us. "'In one respect, you are right, "'for I am ready to quarrel with everyone today, "'but you have the first claim, Monsieur Donglard.' "'Sir,' replied Donglard, pale with anger and fear, "'I warn you,' "'When I have the misfortune to meet with a mad dog, I kill it, "'and far from thinking myself guilty of a crime, "'I believe I do society a kindness. "'Now, if you are mad and try to bite me, "'I will kill you without pity. "'Is it my fault that your father has dishonoured himself?' "'Yes, miserable wretch,' cried Morcerf. "'It is your fault.' "'Donglar retreated a few steps. "'My fault?' said he. "'You must be mad. "'What do I know of the Grishan affair? "'Have I travelled in that country? "'Did I advise your father to sell the castle of Yanina to betray? "'Silence!' said Albert, with a thundering voice. "'No, it is not you who have directly made this exposure "'and brought this sorrow on us, but you hypocritically provoked it.' "'I? "'Yes, you. "'How came it known?' "'I suppose you read it in the paper on the account from Yanina. "'Who wrote to Yanina? "'To Yanina? "'Yes, who wrote for particulars concerning my father? "'I imagine any one may write to Yanina. "'But one person only wrote. "'One only? "'Yes, and that was you. "'I... "'Doubtless wrote, it appears to me that when about to marry your daughter to a young man, "'it is right to make some inquiries respecting his family. "'It is not only a right, but a duty.' "'You wrote, sir, knowing what answer you would receive.' "'I? Indeed, I assure you,' cried Donglar with a confidence and security "'proceeding less from fear than from the interest he really felt for the young man.' I solemnly declare to you that I should never have thought of writing to Yanina did I know anything of Ali Pasha's misfortunes. Who then urged you to write? Tell me. Pardieu, it was the most simple thing in the world. I was speaking of your father's past history. I said the origin of his fortune remained obscure. The person to whom I addressed my scruples asked me where your father had acquired his property— I answered, in Greece. Then, said he, write to Yanina. And who thus advised you? No other than your friend, Monte Cristo. The Count of Monte Cristo told you to write to Yanina? Yes, and I wrote, and will show you my correspondence if you like. Albert and Beauchamp looked at each other. Sir, said Beauchamp, who had not yet spoken, "'You appear to accuse the Count, who is absent from Paris at this moment, and cannot justify himself.' "'I accuse no one, sir,' said Donglar. "'I relate, and I will repeat before the Count what I have said to you.' "'Does the Count know what answer you received?' "'Yes, I showed it to him. "'Did he know my father's Christian name was Fernand, and his family name Mondego?' Yes, I had told him that long since, and I did only what any other would have done in my circumstances, and perhaps less, when, the day after the arrival of this answer, your father came by the advice of Monte Cristo to ask my daughter's hand for you. I decidedly refused him, but, without any explanation or exposure, in short, why should I have any more to do with the affair? How did the honour or disgrace of Monsieur de Morcerf affect me? It neither increased nor decreased my income. Albert felt the blood mounting to his brow. There was no doubt upon the subject. Donglar defended himself with the baseness, but at the same time with the assurance of a man who speaks the truth, at least in part, if not wholly, not for conscience's sake, but through fear. Besides, what was Morcerf seeking? 
It was not whether Danglars or Monte Cristo was more or less guilty. It was a man who would answer for the offence, whether trifling or serious. It was a man who would fight, and it was evident Danglars would not fight. And in addition to this, everything forgotten or unperceived before presented itself now to his recollection. Monte Cristo knew everything. As he had bought the daughter of Ali Pasha, and knowing everything, he had advised Donglar to write to Yanina. The answer known, he had yielded to Albert's wish to be introduced to Haiti, and allowed the conversation to turn on the death of Ali, and had not opposed Haiti's recital. But having doubtless warned the young girl in the few Romaic words he spoke to her, not to implicate Morcerf's father. Besides, had he not begged of Morcerf not to mention his father's name before Haiti? Lastly, he had taken Albert to Normandy when he knew the final blow was near. There could be no doubt that all had been calculated and previously arranged. Monte Cristo, then, was in league with his father's enemies. Albert took Beauchamp aside and communicated these ideas to him. "'You are right,' said the latter. "'Monsieur Danglars has only been a secondary agent in this sad affair.' and it is of Monsieur de Monte Cristo that you must demand an explanation. Albert turned. Sir, said he to Danglars, understand that I do not take a final leave of you. I must ascertain if your insinuations are just, and I am going now to inquire of the Count of Monte Cristo. He bowed to the banker and went out with Beauchamp, without appearing to notice Cavalcanti. Danglars accompanied him to the door, where he again assured Albert that no motive of personal hatred had influenced him against the Count of Morcerf. End of chapter 87